I would like to welcome everyone to the May 13th, 2021 work session of the Michael County School Board. The first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. The agenda is approved. The next item on the agenda is a closed session for discussion of matters covered under item A1 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia as amended pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, salaries, disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees. Is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins, is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Kinsella. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. We will now go into closed session. We will reconvene the work session at the conclusion of our closed meeting. We want to secure a motion to certify closed session. Is there a motion to certify closed session? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it. The closed session has been certified. Um, Mrs. Shea, can you read the mission statement, please? Sure. Henrico County Public Schools, an innovative leader in educational excellence, will actively engage our students in diverse educational, social, and civic learning experiences that inspire and empower them to become contributing citizens. Thank you so much, Mrs. Shea. Um, the next item on our agenda is the, rec the recognition of our superintendent. It is recommended that the school board adopt a resolution by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents and Virginia School Board Association to recognize Dr. Amy Cashwell as Virginia Superintendent of the Year for 2021, for 2020 and 2021. Uh, due to the extraordinary leadership of 133 public school division superintendents during the 2020-2021 school year and their roles in serving their communities through the COVID-19 pandemic, VASS and VSBA are honoring all 133 divisions superintendents as Virginia Superintendents of the Year. Can we give her a round of applause as Superintendent of the Year? <laughs> Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Chairman, and um, I appreciate the recognition very much and uh, would say that it's uh, deserved by the entire HCPS team in this case and, and what an extraordinary year it was, uh, but we are stronger together. Uh, the first item that I have for the board is I am seeking your approval of an administrative appointment. Thank you so much, Mrs. Madam Superintendent. Is there a motion to approve the appointment of administrative personnel? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. The administration, administrative appointment is approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The board has approved John Casulo, safety and security coordinator in our division of operations. The next item is the recommendation that the school board adopt the previously approved fiscal year 21-22 annual financial plan, which has been amended uh, since it was first shared with you. But of course, uh, you've been kept up to date along the way. And but just for uh, the public's awareness, remind everybody of the plan that we'll be adopting. You can see a summary here um, that uh, includes the compensation adjustments, which are phased uh, beginning in April into the next fiscal year. Uh, in a number of areas. Also, our operating fund summary, which shows a 10% increase over last year. And then, of course, as has been the case in prior years, the bulk of our funding is geared uh, towards the area of instruction. So you can see similar trends following into the coming fiscal year. And um, then our revenue summaries there as well. 
So we are at May 13th, uh, moving along the process with uh, the school board. The county has adopted this budget, so now we're seeking the board's approval of this final version of the budget and then look forward to appropriating these funds July 1 for the upcoming fiscal year. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about ultimately seeking your approval of our financial plan. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the previously approved FY21-22 annual financial plan with amendments? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Shea, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Ogburn, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. The plan has been adopted. Thank you so much. Uh, the next item we have is our health committee update. And so as has become customary, Beth Tigan and Robin Gilbert are here to provide us an overview of all things health committee related. Um, not only uh, thinking about this school year, but beginning to think about how we transition into uh, summer programming in, in the um, next school year. So I will turn it over to Dr. Tigan. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. The Health Committee has met three times since our last update on April 22nd at the school board meeting. And the highlights of these Health Committee meetings are shown here on this slide. We've been reviewing the most recent data and comparing last week's student and teacher attendance data to the baseline, providing an update on the status of contact tracing and current case levels, continuing the discussion around vaccines, examining current staffing levels within our school health services, setting the criteria to transition from one tier to another when determining volunteer opportunities within our schools and discussing the impact of the most recent amendment to the governor's order number 72 and finally looking ahead to the 2021-2022 school year. Let's begin with a look at our most current core indicators for determining community transmission, as well as the secondary criteria to assess the level of impact of that transmission on our schools. Since April 21st, the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons within the last seven days has plummeted from 138.5 to 56.79. And the percentage of PCR tests that are positive um, with, during the last seven days dropped from 5.2% to 3.3%. Needless to say, it has been um, a great three weeks. The community transmission level is now at the substantial level. And in addition, though, to these two indicators, as I said earlier, the committee reviewed the data related to the secondary criteria. And the secondary indicators are transmission within school, student absenteeism, and staff capacity. The good news is the number of outbreaks remains unchanged. That was until this morning. This morning we got word that we have one additional outbreak. Um, but really the transmission levels in the schools have remained at the low impact level. The attendance numbers for students learning in person last week were calculated and compared to the baseline that we set back in March. And it was also determined to be at a low impact level. The changes are within a half a percent of the baseline that was set, as I said, the week of March 15th through 19th. And when we consider staff capacity, on average, there were two and a half teachers absent from each school each day last week. This is up slightly from three weeks ago when the average was 2.3 teachers being absent from each school each day, but the demand for substitutes remains low. I would also like to note that the ability to acquire substitute teachers remains high and actually increased minimally early in the week, Monday through Wednesday, and decreased minimally at the end of the week, Thursday and Friday. Those are trends we're used to seeing around holiday weekends, knowing that that was leading into um, Mother's Day. And at this point, I will turn it over to Ms. Gilbert to talk about contact tracing. Chairman Cooper, Dr. Cashwell and board members, 
We continue to work on contact tracing um, in our office, and this shows a decline. Get you the right slide there. Oops. There we go. Um, it is showing a decline as the uh, numbers reflect in our community on that downward um, slope, which is really good. Um, and many of our cases right now are around our students, which we know up until yesterday could not be vaccinated. So this really does show us the importance and significance of getting those vaccinations. As contact tracing will continue into our summer and the school year of 21-22, it's important that our employees, as well as our student families, notify our contact tracers if they have been fully vaccinated. This will allow that contact tracer with permission to verify that vaccination as well as the two week period post vaccination and allow as long as they are asymptomatic an earlier return into our schools. As we transition into our summer programs, our contact tracing teams will also transition. Our nurses will return to in school where they can work with their children and our partners at Richmond Henrico Health Department will collaborate with the individual school directly as well as school health to follow our cases and exposures at the school level and will be the primary contact doing the contact tracing. While we continue to watch our community and school case numbers for illness symptoms, we do remain at that 10 day recommended quarantine. We are looking forward to the day that we get to below 50 cases per 100,000, which we hope will be in the next couple of weeks. At this point, we will be able to drop that quarantine period to a 24 hour period. So that would mean that a child that has illness symptoms could come back 24 hours after those illness symptoms resolve. Um, we will continue to work with both our staff and students who have chronic conditions or special needs to resolve these individual situations. Our vaccination efforts continue at the Richmond Raceway and this will be through the 27th. We have two events next week and then two events the following week. Um, our nurses do continue to support those efforts on Wellness Wednesdays. And as of yesterday, we did see um, not only the FDA, but also the CDC with the support of VDH, um, acknowledge and approve Pfizer to be used for our children 12 years of age and up. So this means that we will begin to vaccinate uh, those children at the raceway, which is extremely good news. Um, the two events at the Raceway have extended hours this week and the two events the following week will have extended hours. So we will start vaccinating at 8 a.m. and run those events to 6 p.m. in hopes that we will have some hours in there for our working parents to get their kiddos as well as themselves into the Raceway to get their immunization. We have moved those events now. We are actually on the infield at our raceway. So that is a really neat feature to be able to say you've come and gotten your COVID vaccine on the infield at Richmond Raceway. Um, you'll actually be able to do this in one of the bays where our cars park. You'll be able to see the raceway. You will be able to see the grandstand. Um, you will actually be able to be right there outside pit row. And on exit, you'll actually drive across the raceway itself, which is kind of neat. Um, so we're really hoping that that will encourage people to come out and see us along with the fact, again, once you're fully vaccinated and you've been two weeks post that full vaccination, you do have the ability to not have to stay in quarantine, which means if you have an exposure and you're asymptomatic, whether you're a staff member or student, you will return right back to instruction immediately without delay. Our recruitment efforts uh, for vacancies continue for our open license as well as aid positions. We do still have those two open RN positions, which we are now actively interviewing for. Um, we have some really good candidates, so I hope when we come back before you again, I'll have some positive news to report there. I do have three RNs, um, two who are retiring and one who will be stepping down at uh, the end of the school year. So we have started those active recruitments as well. Uh, there are 21 clinic aid positions open right now, and we continue to recruit for those positions. So if we have any um, parents out there who want to come and work for us, um, any community members, we encourage you to go online and apply. We would love to train you, and we will train you in our clinic to work beside our school nurses. 
um, and we will have these aides supporting our school nurses through the summer, um, summer, summer academy programs. Um, for summer recruitment, we have five schools that need both a license and a clinic aid, um, and then five schools that have an aid but still need a license. So 10 schools that we're still recruiting active nurses for. And Dr. Tigan will come back up to finish your uh, report for today. Thank you, Robin. Well, as a reminder from last month's update, the volunteer program is being implemented in a three-tiered system. The recommendation is to use the community transmission level within Henrico to determine the current tier. Tier one applies to schools when the transmission level within the county is high based on the VDH's school metrics. This means volunteers may work outside the building. Transitioning to tier two occurs when the VDH's school metrics indicate the local transmission level is substantial. As this is the current transmission level, volunteers may now work inside our schools in non-student spaces, such as the front desk um, and being able to sit or, when they can sit or stand six feet from others. Volunteers will not be permitted to work in classrooms, the cafeteria or gyms while in tier two. When we do transition to tier three, the, and the trend, the, which will be when the transmission level falls to the moderate range, then volunteers may assist in classrooms, cafeterias, and gyms. They may work in proximity with students and staff as long as they wear a mask and practice social distancing. With the health metrics allowing us to move from tier one to tier two, and hopefully soon to tier three, it is important for our volunteers to remember that they will be required to complete a health screening, including a temperature check before being allowed into the school. They will also be required to wear a multi-layered cloth mask and practice social distancing at all times. And while the principal and volunteer coordinator at the school will know which tier level that the division is currently operating in, the principal does have the discretion to determine whether or not the school will implement that tier level. As the community transmission level improves, there will likely be other changes as well and possible amendments to that Executive Order 72. As recently as last Thursday, Governor Northam amended Executive Order 30, 72 for the sixth time, and he made it effective immediately. This action aligned Virginia's mass requirements with the recommendations of the CDC for fully vaccinated individuals, and it adjusted the spectator limits to be the following. The total number of persons for indoor venues cannot exceed the lesser of 50% of the lowest capacity occupancy load um, that's on the certificate of occupancy or if applicable up in up to 1,000 persons, so whichever is lower. And the total number of persons for outdoor venues is also at 50% of that occupancy level or 5,000 persons. Spectators specifically for recreational sports must wear masks over their nose and mouth still at all times, and six feet of physical distancing must be maintained between spectators who are not family members. Masks are still required indoors. While fully vaccinated individuals do not have to wear masks outdoors when alone or in small gatherings, this does not impact our schools. Students are currently permitted to remove their mask outside if they are 10 feet from another student, and this will remain unchanged through the last day of school as we follow the current HCPS COVID-19 health plan. And according to the governor, additional COVID-19 restrictions will be loosened on May 15th when he releases the seventh amendment of his executive order, 72. And pertinent to schools is the maximum number of individuals permitted in social gatherings, as it will increase um, to 100 people for indoor settings and 250 from outdoor settings. That's up from 50 and 100 respectively. The governor also indicated there would be additional changes to current restrictions beginning June 15th. He stated Virginia will lift all capacity and social distancing restrictions on June 15th, 
if, that's the caveat, if COVID-19 case numbers continue to drop and vaccine rates continue to rise. So what does all this mean for next school year? Well, the health committee discussed preparations for the upcoming school year in length this past Monday. Before sharing the recommendations, I would like to say the committee acknowledges that there is no zero risk scenario as we move into the 21-22 school year, but the, recommend, the recommendations discussed to date include the following. Social distancing, the commitment for the fall is to have a full return to in-person learning every student every day. Knowing there will be more students attending in person, schools will provide the three foot social distancing to the greatest extent possible. As far as masks, we will continue to follow the guidance provided by the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health with regard to universal mask wearing. So we will continue to monitor that over the summer. As far as wellness time, the thought was that time should be devoted within the school day to focus on mental wellness and social emotional learning. While th there will be dedicated intentional time during morning meetings at the elementary school and during counselor led lessons also at the elementary level, at the secondary level, the advisory should have that same dedicated time for the focus on wellness. It is important that teachers are able to embed social emotional supports and mental wellness throughout the day. We also discuss field trips. When students return to in-person learning in the fall, grade level and division-wide field trips will be reinstated. The transition team's role will be expanded to include review of school requested field trips that do not fall into the category of grade level or division wide field trips, such as course trips to New York City or band trips to Disney World. To in and the um, transition team will ensure adherence to all current health and safety mitigation procedures for those trips. Other topics will be discussed at future meetings to ensure that there is up-to-date guidance for the 21-22 school year. And I can't say enough about community feedback. Feedback from our staff and our families is always appreciated and shared at the health committee meetings. And we want to encourage them to continue to share their thoughts about a safe return to full in-person learning in September. They may continue to provide feedback through the online and in-person public comment options through, for the school board, as well as reaching out to Dr. Grant, Dr. Hughes, or myself. As I wrap up today's presentation, just know the health committee continues to monitor for and discuss updates to practices suggested by the CDC and the VDH. As more and more data becomes available, the recommended actions are likely to continue to shift. We anticipate a significant shift on June 15th when the governor releases the seventh amendment of the executive order 72. Ms. Gilbert and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tigan and Ms. Gilbert. I'll start to my left, uh, Mrs. Atkins. No comment at this time, well done. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. I'm good, thank you. Ms. Shea. Wow, well, I have some comments and questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I just, I find myself a little bit almost emotional with this update that you're giving me, I, giving us. I, I feel like I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I know I emailed you uh, the other week when we turned orange and, you know, we had a celebratory moment, but um, <laughs> thinking about next year and all, you know, and as we watch these rates plummet, it, it really just is almost an emotional response and, and all the hard work that you and your team have done this year. A couple of questions. You mentioned that as of this morning, there's one additional outbreak. Could you share, um, not necessarily what school it was, but can you share like, was that in transportation or the classroom or athletics? Do we know? Um, I wasn't on the call, so I'm gonna let um, Ms. Gilbert. It was a, a school program. Oh, okay, at a school program. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, and just um, 
to, to circle back, we talked, you, we talked some about contact tracing and um, how being vaccinated could um, impact that. Um, and I know I've gotten quite a few um, emails, particularly from high school parents and, and about athletics and that sort of thing. So um, I just wanna be clear, I understand. So if a student is vaccinated and it's already been that two weeks, so you know they're fully, fully inoculated, if you will, um, if they are contact traced to have had contact with someone, but they are asymptomatic, they do, are you saying they do not have to quarantine? Right, the contact tracer will, they'll have to tell the contact tracer. Dr. Tiger, they, pull the mic up for me. I'm for, sorry, they'll right. have to They'll have to let the contact tracer know that they have been vaccinated. The contact tracer can verify that inside the VAM system, which is what the Virginia Department of Health uses. And once verified, if they're asymptomatic and fully vaccinated, which as you said, you know, one or two shots, depending on which vaccine posts, and then two weeks after that, then they will be able to return to school um, or for employees to work. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, for the vaccination events that run from um, eight to six, obviously a large bulk of that is during the school day. If that's the only opportunity that some of the students have to um, get vaccines, would that be an excused absence from school? Absolutely, we will work with with families. Um, we've extended the hours and hope to help that. It's also um, one of the days each week is a Wednesday, so we're hoping that that helps with attendance. Um, but we will certainly work with families. They just like any doc. This is to me like a medical appointment where they're going for a vaccine. Awesome. Um, you, you mentioned that outdoors students will still need to be masked at this time unless they're ten feet away. So. Um, so at recess, they would still need to be masked. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, that was the recommendation of the health committee. And can you just, get, um, I know I've gotten quite a bit of response about that as well. Can you just articulate why that is? Well, on the current guidance, it's saying that if you're with another individual or a small group, and, and the reality is that co kids congregate on the playground, um, you know, we the teachers work really hard to keep that social distancing, but we know with kids, it can often be difficult, especially when it's at play. And so, um, we, and we also felt like when parents made a decision to come back into school, they, there were certain expectations that they had. And, um, you know, where we are and what the conditions under which no masks are allowed, um, that it, this was not the time. So as we get to towards the end of the year where it gets, could get significantly hot, hotter, luckily we've had a little bit of a, a relief in the cold. Um, if students needed a mask break, the teacher would need to orchestrate making sure that yes. students were separate, but that is a possibility. It's been a possibility all year, yes ma'am. Awesome. Um, I just loved hearing about next year. It just brought me so much joy. Um, so just again, um, the masks for next year are a really heavy topic um, for families on, on kind of um, both viewpoints on it. So um, just to articulate, Mask, masking for next year, that has not been decided yet. No. And you said it would follow CDC and... And VDH. And VDH. Okay. Um, what about plexiglass for next year? Um, we haven't really delved into the plexiglass plexiglass either for next year. That's actually a conversation on Monday's agenda. Um, you know, we know that there's mixed feelings about that as far as some families would like to see that go away. We also know we have staff and, and children who aren't vaccinated, some can't be vaccinated, and that's still um, a a sense of comfort to them. And so we want to, you know, be careful about what we're saying. Um, you know, we know that there are some classrooms now that, that kids may not choose to use them. Um, some kids do, some kids don't in a classroom. Um, it has, you know, we've not mandated it in the classrooms, but we've provided it. And the fact that um, they're still being used shows there's comfort in that. I say it's it's not just adults. I think it's also our students who some of them want that comfort of so, being a, another layer of protection. So part of that's actually new information to me. So I, I want to just make sure I'm clear on this. The plexiglass has not been mandated in the classrooms, but has been provided. Correct. Okay. So if a parent ha is very concerned about their child having plexiglass around their desk, that 
is a conversation perhaps to have with their administrator well, or teacher. And I should say it, it's been, it hasn't been mandated for our teachers, you know, the adults, it's twofold. There are adults and there are children. Um, and so while it has been provided, I, you know, there are some classrooms where a decision has been made not to use them fully or, you know, and so we have allowed that within classrooms. Thank you. Um, and then just the last thing, I, I appreciate you bringing up community feedback. Um, I, you know, I forge you a lot of emails uh, that I get, and so I think it's important that the community knows, you know, we're not just saying we'll pass this along to the no. health committee. We truly are passing yes. it along to you and the health committee, and then um, you bring it up. And so um, I appreciate you making that point. Um, and that's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Shea, Mrs. Kinsella. Yeah, I only have one thing really that, Mar that Mrs. Shea didn't already cover. Um, and, and actually it's a little bit, um, it's a continued conversation as to one of the questions she just asked. When, when I'm talking with constituents and hearing from folks um, outside of community feedback, um, community members are concerned that um, some voices perhaps will be louder than others. And what will we ultimately follow? Because I just want to, I want this on the record that we will ultimately follow what the CDC and the VDH say. Is that, that, is, that is our guiding force. Now we have conversations about things because there are times where maybe the, the health committee has um, feelings, of, different feelings about things, but as a whole, that's been our guiding source the whole, the whole time is what is what is the CDC recommending and what is the VDH? And sometimes they've not been aligned and that's caused some angst. But um, you know, that is those are our guiding resources. And we have our members of our of our health district that are there that are part of VDH and the Henrico Health District, you know, in our health committee meetings to be able to help provide guidance as well. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, I just wanted that reiterated on the record that ultimately we do follow CDC and VDH. And then what, sometimes even the committee is a little bit more conservative. I know we were uh, with and the social distancing, I believe, right? Well, and that's one instance. And you know, that's where we have to also as, as a, um, a health committee, but even more importantly, as a leadership team, is looking at the impact of decisions on staff and on students. So, you know, that that comes into play as well. Okay, thank you. You're That's welcome. Thank you so much. Real quick, Dr. Teigen, um, so can you just speak briefly to the wellness piece? I know that you broached it um, in regards to the supports to the students and staff um, that that is reflective of the supports that they're receiving now during the Wellness Wednesday um, paradigm, if you will. How, how are we building that in going forth, forward um, for staff and for students that, that it will reflect, you know, the Wellness Wednesdays now? You know, for students, it's really through those, not, not only through the specific times where um, things can be that are planned for, which is the morning meetings at the elementary and counselor lessons at the elementary level. But at, at secondary level, that would be um, the same as like the advisories. We know we do different things in the advisories, but having specific um, days and times where the focus really is on that wellness piece. Um, outside of that, we also know that, um, you know, it's, it's not something that should be chunked just in one time. It needs to be, is really working with our teachers as to how do you um, use those strategies and so on too throughout the school day. Um, as far as staff, we have looked into some additional um, supports for staff. We currently have our um, EAP, which is our employee assistance plan, but we're also looking at other things to help support our staff. Good. I mean, I think it's so stay imperative. Tuned. Yeah, I appreciate that because it's important to to make sure that we are we're still continuing, you know, the efforts that we have made this year, um, because the need is not going to go away just because, you know, we're doing we're doing school differently. So thank you so much. I look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you again, Ms. Gilbert, for all that you're doing. You and your staff, please send our uh, our thanks to them and to you as well, Dr. Tigan. Oh, Reverend Cooper. Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind, I, have, I do have one follow up. Um, you said something earlier about how often you meet. If you could reiterate that, because while we're talking, 
new guidance just popped up. <laughs> so of course, I mean, I, I think it can't be stated enough that this is a very fluid situation. It changes daily, guidance changes daily as we learn more. But if you could, since we have new guidance, and just reiterate how uh, often you meet and how you consider that new guidance as absolutely. it comes to you. Um, probably since the last week in December, we have met weekly. Um, we had started off meeting, you know, every two weeks. Um, and then as we were looking at the impacts of the Thanksgiving holiday and, you know, the winter break, because winter break was two weeks, the, we didn't, we missed a week in there. Other than that, we've probably met every week since, um, since Thanksgiving. And, and, so, and so I, I can't echo enough what um, Mrs. Shea said about next year. I am so excited to hear about plans for the fall. And I know our communities are as well, but I think it's important for us to note that all new information is considered and this is a flexible plan for the fall and we change when we need to change. Absolutely. And so before the email starts saying, well, today we got new guidance, it's, it's just, I think it's incumbent upon us to recognize that we take that new guidance into account every day and every meeting that, that you guys have so that our plans change accordingly. So um, I, I yes, just- Yes, ma'am, it's been a fluid year. <laughs> absolutely, well, and, and I think if, if we've learned nothing else, flexibility is, is, is the order of the day. And because um, I know we've already, we've gotten emails like Mrs. Shea said about plans for the fall for wearing masks and distancing, et cetera. And it's, it's May, we can't predict what August is going to bring, but know that we will be evaluating it and your committee will all summer long. And what happens on day one of school may be different from what happens on day two, but we'll, we just need to know we're, we're looking at it all the time. Absolutely. But thank you. I just You're welcome. Appreciate that. And and just recognizing Miss Gilbert as this is yesterday um, was the end of our celebration of Nurses Week, but we know that our nurses are celebrated every day. And um, you know, if you want to know who my nurse of the year is, she's standing right here. So thank you, Robin. For all you do. Thank you, Dr. Tigan and Mrs. Gilbert. Also echo our deep appreciation to you and the entire team as yesterday was National School Nurses Day and hope you feel continue to feel celebrated. You are appreciated so very much. Uh, Dr. Tigan, don't go too far because I think the next item is yours. Uh, as you know, Dr. Tigan uh, chairs our calendar committee and we are bringing forward for the board's consideration and seeking your approval uh, in relation to a revision to our 2020-2021 school calendar as it affects our uh, student instructional time. So Dr. Tigan. Absolutely. Um, last year, I feel like as a school division, um, we led the region in the state by observing um, Juneteenth for our staff. And this year, um, since then, in March of this year, the governor um, has designated Juneteenth or June 19th as a specific date of which the state, it would become a state holiday. And as such, we would like you to consider um, changing June 17th um, to be the last day of school, a full day of school for students and staff, and, June t and Juneteenth being observed on Friday, June 18th. Um, this, is, this is really a significant holiday. And like I say, I feel like we have led the area um, on this effort to really recognize all of our staff and all of our families. And so um, allow you to consider that and provide, ask any questions and provide any feedback. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tigan. Um, I'm not gonna call names, but are there any questions or comments from the board? Anyone? Thank you, um, colleagues. Um, hearing no questions or um, no concerns is there again thank you again for that I just I don't want to to minimize the significance 
of the celebration of Juneteenth. We know what it's for when, when the news finally got to Galveston, Texas, you know, that the Emancipation Proclamation two years early had been signed and so therefore giving us um, another step toward freedom. So we are so appreciative of our governor making that a um, national holiday and, and to you and to Dr. Um, Cashwell for and staff for leading the way in the region for us recognizing that. So we do we do appreciate that. So and, that and I will share quickly that, you know, we've already looked at the 21-22 calendar and um, J Juneteenth, the 19th, would be on a Sunday. And so we would celebrate that on Monday as a staff holiday. And that wouldn't affect the student calendar, oh, right. so no revision would be needed Correct. for that next year because it falls outside of that instructional window, unlike this year. Michelle? Yeah, that was my exact question. As we move forward as this becoming a staple in our annual calendar, you know, taking that into account as we plan it. Um, and so I was just pulling up the 21-22 calendars you were speaking to double check that. And I'm glad yep. you're, as always, one step ahead of me, Dr. Tigan. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, um, board members, is there a motion to approve the proposed revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kinsella. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. The calendar has been approved. Thank you. Our um, calendar will be reflected um, based on that change. Okay, our next item, uh, which I know will be of interest to a number of board members, uh, seeing as this revision comes from a board request, and this is a revision to our policy P6-03-011, school assignment and variance procedures. Along with my seeking your approval of this policy today, I am asking the board to waive the 30-day review period um, to prop to approve these proposed revisions. Do I have any questions related to this revision? Um, thank you. I just wanted to um, thank both Ms. Kinsella and Ms. Ogburn for championing this in the policy committee. Um, it's, I, I think it will be a great help for some of our um, staff families that really um, need this support and puts their elementary school students on the same um, schedule and calendar um, as themselves as working parents. So thank you to both of my colleagues for um, advocating um, for the board's voice in the policy committee to get it to this point. Just, I'll, I'll just be quick. Thank you for that. Um, now, this has been uh, the topic of great deal of conversation, but I want to thank the teachers who reached out to let us know that this was an issue. And because over the years, we've had I've heard from a number of teachers who live in other counties, who have um, who have you know real childcare transportation needs. And if you think about it, a teacher who's leaving Hanover to come to work in Henrico has a transportation issue with a um, elementary age child that they're leaving at home possibly. Um, and they're like, what do I do? The bus hasn't come yet. And I hear this a lot from teachers. And so we, we started talking about this as a real benefit to our elementary teachers for the convenience and welfare of their children and their families. So to me, this is a, uh, a real win for our teachers to to have this benefit and it'll just make things easier and and so i think we're um we're all on the same page we want to do that for our teachers and make sure that that we're listening to their concerns and that's what this is is just response to the number of people who have spoken up which we you know which we don't hear enough i don't think um, about things like this that are really day-to-day -day help for our teachers but that's what was behind it but I'll turn it over to Ms. Kinsella if she has additional thoughts. But Yes, it was actually, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything you just said that we did. Um, I know Ms. Ogburn and I specifically heard from quite a few teachers advocating for it. So um, this is one more way that we could recruit and perhaps retain. And then I know that typically... Um, the fee portion of this is gonna come in a couple minutes when we get to the fee discussion, but I, I think it makes sense to bring it up now as part of our discussion as to the policy that we've changed. Um, that if, if Dr. Uh, Cashwell or Dr. Tigan could uh, explain to folks how the tuition rate that we've put forward is set and how um, it compares 
uh, to perhaps some of our regional partners and, and its competitiveness. Absolutely, and, and I see Mr. Wack is getting up as well as our finance officer. Um, the tuition we have calculated for many years and it's based on the local share. Um, and so w there are other localities that charge more than that local share. They charge considerably more than that, that they add the state share in there that um, is probably questionable. And then there's other localities that it's less or it's, they might have no fee for their staff and some localities have eliminated that option for. So it varies depending on localities around the Richmond region. And I will just add on to that. Thank you, Dr. Teigen. You know, by charging only that local portion, um, you know, there is an expense to this. Um, you know, there, uh, while the state covers some of the cost of a student through our annual daily membership count, there is a local share to that. And so we want to make sure we're mindful of that, but also keeping it as low as possible so that we're also um, mindful of the, uh, the impact on the, the teacher or the other staff members who may be making this choice for their family. Thank you both, and You're welcome. apologies, Mr. <laughs> Weck. Um, just Dr. Tigan sat on the policy committee, so she was in the in-depth uh, discussions as uh, Ms. Ogburn and I sat in the uh, policy committee, so thank you. Um, that's all I have, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Shane. Um, thank you, Dr. Tigan, or sorry, Dr. Cashwell, thank you for clarifying that we do get to heat the state ADM. That was, you know, from a financial point, I wasn't sure. So thank you for clarifying that. And then I just want to clarify off something Ms. Ogburn said. Um, it's, it is for any permanent um, employee, regardless if they're middle school, high school, elementary school, the elementary school boundary on it is for the age of the child. That's correct. correct. Any employee who is a permanent full-time or permanent part-time employee is eligible to bring their elementary child. The elementary piece only applies to the child attending. Perfect. Thank you. I, I know that um, many teachers have been, you know, excited about this. And so I just wanted to make sure we were really explicit on who it applies to. All right, thank you so much. Uh, seeing that there are no more questions, is there a motion to waive the 30-day review period and approve proposed revisions to policy P6-03-011 school assignment variance procedures? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Ogburn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. The policy has been approved. It's been waived. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. The time frame's been waived. Yep, you can. Right. Sorry, well, last question. Um, in terms of this being um, in place for next year, um, I don't know if the variance period has already closed, but if it has, will it reopen for teachers to take advantage? Of yeah, this? we have a variance procedure and we will notify employees once this policy takes effect of that procedure and they'll be able to um, take advantage of that accordingly. And Perfect. I think that for our staff, if they're hearing this and are work, thinking I'm going to get my paperwork filled out, we actually have an online application for our staff like we used this past year for those staff who brought their um, children here, you know, because of COVID. So anyway, we have an online process. It's a little bit streamlined. And so hopefully that will help our staff. Well, good. And I know we also... Um you know, need those decisions in a timely manner as well for enrollment and complement and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to make sure that they would be able to take care of it, uh, take advantage of it for next year. Thank you. All right, uh, appreciate the board's waiver of the 30 day and approval of the policy. Oh, have we only waived the 30 period, 30 day period? Yeah, oh. so that was the way. Now we have to approve. That's yeah. all right. Okay. <laughs> so is there a motion to approve the policy P6-01 <laughs> P6-03-011 school assignment variance procedures. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Go ahead. That's all, fine. All those, <laughs> is a, a dual second by Mrs. Ogburn and Ms. Shea. Is there, um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The policy's been approved. 
Thank you, members of the board. The next series of policies are all um, revisions that we're bringing forth for your review. And then at a subsequent board meeting, I'll be seeking your approval of those. So the first one, um, I'm seeking uh, an opportunity for you to ask any questions you might have, or just at least a first review of the proposed retirement of policy P4-09-017. Board members, any questions? Okay, also um, offering an opportunity to review revisions to policy P6-03-002. Board members, any questions or discussion? Okay, also bringing forward revisions to policy P6-03-008. Board members, any discussions or comments? Okay, also bringing forth proposed revisions to policy P6-19-021. Any comments or questions? Okay, also bringing forth proposed revisions to policy P6-20-002. I do have a question on that one, Dr. Castro. In, um, in paragraph one, the fourth sentence, um, can we add the word legal guardians beside the word parents? Absolutely. I know they were working towards making that kind of a change across all policies Absolutely. and for That's consistency. One we, 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 we will, didn't catch that one. We will make sure we adjust that before we seek your approval of that policy. And, and a question on in paragraph two, would it be possible to add how to how a request for a reduction or waiver of the fees would be handled and who would approve the request? Is that possible? We can look to add some clarification there. And I know also when we publish our fee schedule, um, that's another place parents are looking probably even more often than into our policy. And that would be helpful information we can make sure we're um, providing. Just want to make sure whatever method you feel is the best way to communicate it, just want to make sure it's yeah, clear, that's a all. Very important point, thank you. Uh, we can also um, add that to our, we meet every Monday. So um, we can review that on Monday and that way we can still get it in for June. Appreciate you, Ms. Lockmore. Okay. Anyone else? That one? Okay, next, uh, actually bringing forth uh, four policies which will be unchanged, and that is P7-03-004, P7-09-001, P6-03-014, and P6-06-001. Again, no recommendations for uh, changes based on a review, but we'll be asking for your acceptance of these policies as part of, part of our regular process for adoption of policies. All right. Any questions? Okay, also providing an opportunity uh, for the board to review the policy, would, to review the temporary suspension of policies per the Virginia Department of Education waivers. Any questions related to that review? Okay, onward and upward. Next, I am seeking the board's acceptance of the Virginia Department of Education, Career and Technical Education Competitive Innovative Program Equipment Grant Award. Well, I apologize, I want to get you the, uh, the amount of that. And it is going to be for $37,500 for the Advanced Career Education Center at Hermitage. Ms. Kinsella. Yes, um, we're very excited about this grant. And I just wanted to do a shout out to um, my ACE Center at Hermitage teacher, Mr. Tim Alvett, for taking the initiative to write this grant. Um, he's a, pre a precision machine teacher. And I just wanna thank him so much because grant money is free money. And this machine is gonna be amazing for our students. So thank you so much, Mr. Alvett. Well, Ms. Consello, since you are in the mood of giving congratulatory platitudes, would you give me a motion if I ask you for a motion? I sure would, All so right. moved. All right, let me do it first, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to accept the grant award to the ACE Center Hermitage? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Consello. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Shea. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Next, I am seeking the uh, board's uh, acceptance of grant funding in the amount of $3,000 from the Pacific Life Foundation. Is there a motion to accept the grant funding of $3,000 from the Pacific Life Foundation? 
So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogwin. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Echo Lake will be receiving some additional materials to support their literacy efforts and the implementation of our uh, division's literacy curriculum. All right, for the next item, we're uh, pleased to be able to have Mrs. Alsop provide the board a review of federal grant funding. As you may be aware, uh, we are set to uh, receive funding in the amount of just shy of $15 million. We've heard previously from Donna Davenport regarding our Title VI uh, B, that grant funding, and this is covering a number of other grants. Um, and so welcome, Mrs. Alsop. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, Vice Chair Shea, Dr. Cashwell, and school board members. It is my pleasure to present to you information regarding federal grant applications. Ms. Alsop, do me a favor. There you go. Thank you, ma'am. Yep. There you go. <laughs> federal grant applications for the 2021-2022 school year. As a reminder to the board, these are federal grants that Henrico County Public Schools applies for annually. The federal grants presented are connected to each of our HCPS cornerstones and plays a supportive role to each goal area of the HCPS strategic plan. Federal grants are estimated to be just over $14.7 million. The Title II Part A, Title III Part A, and Title IV Part A grants for 21-22 were prepared using level funding. Based on preliminary allocations received from the Virginia Department of Education, the Title I Grant Part A is projected to have a 12% increase. Final grant allocations from the VDOE are not available until September. The McKinney-Vento funds will remain the same for the 2021-2022 school year, the McKinney-Vento grants are awarded on a competitive basis for three years, and we are entering the second year. Title I Part A is anticipated to be $11.9 million. The application was prepared using direct certification numbers to identify 20 schools for Title I services. Direct certification numbers represent the number of students who may also be receiving SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid. Direct certification represents categorically eligibility for free meals. These 20 schools will operate using the school-wide model, which allows funds to be used for all students. Title I Part A provides funds for additional financial assistance to schools with high numbers of students receiving free or reduced lunch. The grant also provides Title I schools with instructional staffing to support literacy and mathematics. Family advocates and funds to support family engagement are components of each school's budget. Funding is designated for instructional programming supplies, including but not limited to classroom and book room libraries, digital resources and manipulatives. The library at home initiative ensures students in our Title I schools receive books for their homes, uh, home libraries. Pre-K support staff and resources support the early learning preschool program. A portion of Title I funds support the McKinney-Vento program by providing full-time and part-time staff, instructional resources for students, and assistance with school fees for students experiencing homelessness. As a requirement of the grant, funds are also set aside for local Henrico County neglected institutions serving HCPS students, such as John G. Wood School. Professional learning opportunities are mandatory components of the grant and are also included in the application. This grant is coordinated by Dr. Cassandra Willis, Title I Specialist.
here are just a few highlights from our 2021 school year. Sandston Elementary School was awarded the status of National ESEA Distinguished School for their work in closing gaps for students. Each year, federal coordinators submit the names of schools and Sandston was one of two schools selected in Virginia. When the pandemic hit, Title I made certain students and teachers had materials at home, including math manipulative bags, workbooks, and plenty of books to read. Document cameras and iPads were purchased for teachers and Title I coaches. We partnered with several departments, including library services, to assist in replenishing books. Title I is also continuing to replenish classroom libraries. Title II, Part A, is anticipated to be just over 1.3 million. The purpose of Title II, Part A, is to increase academic achievement for all students through improving teacher and administrator quality. The Title II grant will continue to fund six class size reduction positions in identified Title I schools, two intervention instructional coach positions will support student achievement through the division instructional coaching model focused on improving interventions. Reading instructional coaching positions will support identified division needs. Professional learning continues to provide opportunities to focus on the Henrico strategic plan with an emphasis on identified areas. The areas of focus will be special education, equity, diversity, culturally responsive practices, behavior support, social emotional learning, mental health supports, leadership, family engagement, instructional coaching, and all core subjects. This grant is coordinated by me. During the 2021 school year, Title II funds supported 41 professional learning conference opportunities. 681 HCPS staff participated in the opportunities. Using the pay it forward principle, the professional learning has reached beyond the 681 staff members. As a requirement of the grant, the Department of Federal Programs and Foundational Learning randomly selects staff members to complete the Critical Path Professional Learning Accountability Form to share key points from the conference, how and where the information learned will be disseminated, how the professional learning will be evaluated and monitored, and what resources are needed. On the screen are a few comments received on the Critical Path Forms this year. Title III Part A is anticipated to be just over $370,000. Title III Part A is utilized to provide teachers with instructional support through instructional assistance and instructional supplies to support English learners, as well as provide professional learning for division leaders and school staff. A portion of the funds also provides supports for family engagement programs, such as parents as educational partners for parents and guardians who do not speak English. This grant is coordinated by Sarah Modrak, Title III Specialist. Highlights of the 2020-2021 Title III grant include researching and purchasing new instructional materials for language instruction education program teachers to use with students as well as providing professional learning opportunities to staff through a variety of formats, such as book studies and virtual workshops. Additionally, our parent as edu educational partner classes were still held in a virtual format, opening up attendance to an increased number of families. And finally, we are currently purchasing materials to send home with immigrant youth students 
this summer for additional support. Title IV Part A is anticipated to be just over $874,000. Title IV Part A funds are intended to improve students' academic achievement by increasing the capacity of school divisions to provide all students with access to a well-rounded education, improve school conditions for student learning, and increase the effective use of technology. Funding for the Title IV Part A grant will be used to provide elementary and middle school science coaches to model and support science instruction. Funds are also used to make a part-time division reading specialist position full-time to support the division literacy plan. The dedicated McKinney-Vento social worker will assist school staff in discovering and alleviating the barriers to school attendance and meeting the social and emotional needs of students experiencing homelessness. Funding will support the growth of our family and community engagement department by funding three family advocate positions. Funds have been set aside for college board AP student fees to support the division focus on increasing access to minority and free and reduced lunch students. Identified professional learning opportunities will be provided throughout the year. We will support the Life Ready Literacy Plan with the purchase of the digital resource Smarty Ants. Engaging learner-centered experiences will continue with the digital resource Nearpod. Second Step licenses will provide needed resources focused on social emotional learning for secondary students. And this grant is also coordinated by me. During the 2020-2021 school year, the Title IV Part A funds were able to purchase deluxe re recess equipment for each elementary school. To support the creation of videos by students and teachers, each school received a Padcaster starter kit. The Padcaster kit allows for the creation of professional level videos and streaming at the school level. The FACE department purchased reading and math family engagement kits to support families. This year, Title IV Part A funds were able to also support 89 students at identified schools by paying AP fees. The McKinney-Vento grant uses a three-year cycle. 2020-2023 McKinney-Vento subgrant was approved for $97,000 each year. Grant awards are provided to ensure the enrollment, attendance, and success in school of children and youth experiencing homelessness. The Henrico grant provides funding for the McKinney-Vento specialists in clerical support positions. Gas cards to assist families with transporting students to school are also provided. This grant is coordinated by Lisa Ann Abernathy, McKinney-Vento Specialist. The McKinney-Vento team has focused on making connections and building relationships with our students and families. So far this school year, the team has logged well over 4,000 road miles during home visits and making special deliveries. Utilizing funding from Title IV, the McKinney-Vento Grant, and CARES Act funding, the team was able to provide students with school supplies, headsets, lap desks, reading lamps, and thermometers. Summer bridge books and grade level reading books will be provided to support summer learning. Thanks to funding from Title IV, the team added a social worker solely devoted to serving students under McKinney-Vento. The social worker collaborated with school staff in order to directly address attendance concerns with students experiencing housing instability and the ability to forge more connected partnerships with community agencies. In addition, the McKinney-Vento team has utilized funding 
to provide transportation for out of zone and out of district students. The team was also awarded grant funds from Project HOPE that allowed the development and distribution of a trauma-informed training tailored specifically for HCPS educators. I would like to thank each grant coordinator for their work on preparing our federal grants through the HCPS learner-centered lens. Are there any questions or comments at this time? Thank you so much, Ms. Alsop, for the very um, um, detailed uh, presentation. We really appreciate that. Um, I'll start to my right, Ms. Kinsella. No, I just appreciate the level of detail. I don't have any questions because you just explained it so thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Ms. Shea. Uh, Mrs. Ogren. I, I agree with uh, what's already been said. Thank you so much for all your work. Mrs. Um, Atkins. I do have one question. Ms. Alsop, thank you for the presentation and thank your team for all their work, the family advocates and everyone involved in sort of moving the needle forward for our children and our families. Do you happen to have uh, and if you don't know this, of course, you can email me later, but the number of homeless students that we have attending HCPS. At our last uh, count that I have, because I do get a weekly update on the numbers from the team. So at our last count, we had about 562 students, which is less than we've had previously, but we are staying pretty much on trend with what we're seeing nationally at this time. Would you mind emailing me a breakdown per districts um, so that I can have that number and adequately have a conversation at another time? I have several individuals who are out um, providing meals and supplies in the Verina district and I think it would be helpful for them as they continue providing those and then several churches too that are doing the same thing. I think that's good information for them to have and help them with that effort so we can certainly talk at a later time, but if you can email me the breakdown per district, that would be very helpful. Thank okay. you so much. Yes, we can work on that. Thank you. That's it, Ms. Atkins. Okay, yep. I have a couple questions. So on slide four, can you go to the real quick on four? So all those positions, the uh, instructional coaches, family advocates, early learning, um, preschool support staff and homeless staff, you may not know this offhand, but do you, how many positions are those total? Do you know the money, the funds that this funds? Mm, let me think, because I just saw that today. We were just working on the application. Um, if, I am not sure, but I can get you an exact number. Sure, and if you could, can you, what, off, off the top of your head, compare it to last year, are we, do we have as much staff? Do we have less staff? How is that, that, that working? So compared to last year, we have a probably small increase because we did look at doing an increase to our early learning preschool program to help support um, providing enrichment activities for our preschool students okay. and provide our teachers with um, some planning time in there. So I'm sure the additional staff has proven to be helpful. Yes. And so the second question is, will this funding be used to support the students who choose and are admitted to our virtual academy? So at this time, this funding would not um, support the students there. We will continue to look at our virtual academy as we're looking at enrollment to see how their numbers go with free and reduced lunch numbers because of this being the Title um, I grant application. Okay, thank you so much. Can last, last two questions really. Um, the section of slides 12 and 13 kind of just you know geared toward the homeless population that we have, you know, I know Ms. Atkins asked that question, but we are co cognizant of the, of the pandemic, um, the families in crisis, those experience loss of income, um, not received unemployment benefits, um, the renters with the eviction moratorium, um, all those areas. I just want to make sure that we're continuously at the forefront um, of being able to support those families this summer going forward. It's just, it's so important. I mean, that being said also, for our McKinney-Vento um, students, you know, some of them because of that are living in cars. Do we, do we, do we have some that are identified that we know of who are, who are living mobily, if you will? Yes, okay, we so, do have. So that being said, I noticed um, the Box of Opportunity had school supplies. Do we have anything that provides um, with, with hygienic practices for supplies for, for hygiene if they don't have access to running water or anything like do we do that? So to do that because of the restrictions with the funds, we partner. Okay. 
to be able to provide uh, those opportunities for our families to be able to get items such as uh, hygiene supplies. And so we work with our family and community engagement uh, team. And we work with just various community partners that the team has identified to support our families that way. Great. So those who need those specific items, we do have the ability to provide that for them. Yes. Awesome. And last question. I noticed when you talked about the uh, gas cars for families, um, do we provide GRTC access as well if they don't have a car? Do we have do we provide bus passes or anything of that nature? So we do have bus passes uh, and it is, is only for transporting to and from school. Okay. So we're not able to do transportation to other areas, but just to and from school. So if a family does need that, that is something that we have access to. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Awesome. That's all I have. But thank you again for, for um, all of your hard work. You're welcome. I also want to echo my thanks to Mrs. Alsop, you know, as our director of federal programs and foundational learning, while uh, we have a, a number of grant coordinators who have done a phenomenal job uh, putting all of this together. She has not only direct oversight of some of the grants, as you saw, but broad oversight of all of them. And so I think the, the work is incredible and in making sure the way we um, spend these grant funds really matches the needs of our staff and students. And, and um, I think that's been an incredible effort. But but what you may not know is some of the red tape and hurdles that go with a lot of this federal money. And so it's just incre an incredible feat to align it like this um, and also just to manage the logistics. So I just want to thank you as well for your incredible efforts here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next I am so pleased to provide a, a presentation that will be an overview um, of our student support and wellness efforts. So uh, we have uh, two of our central staff members here who are going to present uh, in Liz Parker and Christina Vitek, but I'm really excited. I know they'll be introduced later that we have four okay. guests um, from one of our elementary schools who provide some of the school-based support who have been incredibly patient uh, guests at our meeting here. So I'm thrilled their presentation is up and we'll get to hear about um, the many efforts that are underway uh, with student support and wellness. I don't think there's been a board meeting, uh, certainly in this calendar year, where we have not mentioned the word student support and wellness in some way, shape, or form. I know this is a shared priority for all of us as we continue to work to meet student needs. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Reverend Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. My name is Liz Parker, Director of School Counseling Programs, Student Support and Wellness. And with me today is Christina Vitek, Director of Psychological Services, Student Support and Wellness. And together we are excited to introduce the department that we have the honor of leading and spotlight some of the critical work this department provides for the students and families of Henrico County. To begin, we will start in the same way that we start all of our student support and wellness team meetings, and that is with our why, which is our students. More than 50,000 learners from diverse cultural backgrounds with unique needs attend Henrico schools and rely upon us to provide a quality education and the unique support each student needs to be life ready. As a part of the Division of Learning, Student Support and Wellness focuses on identifying and removing barriers to learning to improve outcomes for all HCPS students. Our priority is to ensure 100% of HCPS students feel included, valued, and supported, and have the tools, resources, and strategies they need to achieve success. The work of the Student Support and Wellness Department directly supports the HCPS Strategic Plan identified in Destination 2025. So who are we? In addition to the two directors, the Department of Student Support and Wellness's central office team includes a school social work supervisor, an extended learning specialist, an intervention specialist supporting our formal mentoring programs, an intervention coordinator supporting the substance abuse awareness and intervention programs, three coordinators of behavior support, a foster care liaison, a section 504 coordinator, and a positive behavior and intervention supports or PBIS coordinator. Records management and administrative services support personnel are also an important part of our team. 
Our staff are licensed under the VDOE to provide services to students pre-K through 12, as well as consultation to teachers and families. You will find the majority of the student support and wellness team members working directly in schools with the total of 244 school-based staff. This includes school counselors, school psychologists, and school social workers, which collectively make up our school-based mental health teams. Additional school-based staff includes our deans of students, behavior support facilitators, and attendance officers, all who are instrumental in realizing our vision. The Department of Student Support and Wellness is committed to examining all of our practices through a culturally responsive lens so that our work validates and reflects the diversity, identities, and experiences of all HCPS students. And as you can imagine, the scope of our work is vast. So to align our work, all student support and wellness staff utilize a multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS framework to guide provision of service and support to students and teachers. MTSS encompasses a continuum of need, enabling schools to promote social emotional learning, as well as mental health and wellness for all students, identify and address problems before they escalate or become chronic, and provide increasingly intensive data-driven services for individual students as needed. You may have noticed that we do not use the terms social emotional learning or SEL and mental health interchangeably, and that is an important distinction. While there is often overlap between the two, and while an effective SEL program can benefit all students, including students with mental health needs, SEL may not be sufficient in meeting the, spe the specific individual needs of students struggling with mental health conditions. While some students with mental health concerns may not have social and emotional skill deficits, others who lack sufficient social and emotional competencies may not also require mental health support. These two domains are distinct, and it is vital that we address student needs from both a social emotional learning competency perspective as well as from a mental health perspective. Today, we will take a look at how student support and wellness uses evidence-based practices to currently address both of these domains, as well as within our work, building and strengthening our trauma-informed practices in all buildings. We will also share how we are planning to prioritize and expand student support services in preparation to address the unique needs of every student as they return to school in the fall. When we, return, when we refer to the term evidence-based, we are speaking specifically to the four tier levels of effectiveness outlined in the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. These are practices that have been studied to show significant positive student outcomes or are grounded in theory and are supported by research. An excellent... An excellent example of the utilization of evidence-based practices is the implementation of social emotional learning curriculums for students in grades K through 12 across the division. HCPS has been ahead of the curve with provision of social emotional learning lessons from curriculum that directly aligns with the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, or CASEL, core competencies of self-awareness, social awareness, self-regulation, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Stanford Harmony, currently named Harmony, was adopted as the elementary SEL curriculum in the spring of 2019, with initial implementation during the 2019-20 school year. Harmony is an evidence-based program that includes three components, meetup, buddy up, and lessons. This provides opportunities for classroom community building, development of peer relationships, and direct instruction on SEL core competencies. The second step, middle school SEL curriculum, was also formally adopted for students during the 2019-20 school year, but full implementation did not occur until this year. Second step lessons are provided weekly during advisory. 
In addition to the lessons, the Second Step curriculum also offers class and community challenges, advisory lessons, and topics for class meetings. All high school students have received locally developed SCL lessons aligned to Castle Core competencies weekly throughout the current school year. Initially, the high schools were to provide nine weeks of direct instruction and then move toward incorporation of SCL signature practices into each class period. However, due to overwhelming requests from students, teachers, and administrators, additional lessons were provided, so we've supplemented weekly instruction throughout the year. We are, proud, we are proud to share that during the 2020-21 school year, all 72 HCPS schools and all non-traditional programs have implemented SEL curriculum to support all students, showing a significant increase from the previous year. Just as important to highlight is the collaborative work the student support and wellness team is leading across departments to support schools in becoming more trauma informed. Based upon the recommendations and work from the Trauma Advisory Committee beginning in 2018, the 2020-21 school year focused on offering differentiated professional learning opportunities and resources for school staff. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has created widespread trauma across the world. And as we prepared for students to return to school, all staff needed a basic level of exposure to trauma awareness or trauma-informed strategies. This year, 100% of school employees completed one of two trauma modules based on their current position in HCPS. Moving forward, any new HCPS employee will be required to complete this trauma training as part of their onboarding process. Furthermore, in January 2021, schools and programs completed the Trauma Responsive School Implementation Assessment, or the TRESIA. Based upon review of data submitted, individual school and district responses were compiled and schools were provided targeted resources and opportunities to support identified areas of growth in their trauma-informed practices. Moving forward, the TRESIA will be completed yearly to monitor school and district progress toward becoming more trauma-informed. HCPS student support and wellness staff members will continue to directly support this work and offer more in-depth, community-connected professional learning experiences with individual teachers and building leaders as requested. Numerous staff on the school-based mental health teams hold the Certified Trauma Practitioner or Equivalent designation, which allows them to provide expert guidance around trauma-informed practices. In addition to staff with the formal certification, even more have completed the coursework required for this certificate, as well as other targeted trauma programming. The Trauma Advisory Committee continues to meet regularly and actively supports schools choosing to prioritize work around trauma-informed practices. For example, when one high school communicated their commitment to addressing the trauma experienced by school personnel over the past year so that they would be ready and capable to begin helping students recover from COVID-related trauma in the fall, the committee immediately developed and began to implement a five-week professional learning series to meet their needs. In addition to trauma-informed practices, HCPS recognizes that school-based mental health services are essential to creating and sustaining physically and psychologically safe schools. And of the students who receive the mental health services they need, 70 to 80% of them receive these services in school. Our current model of school-based mental health clearly identifies the individuals assigned to each building that are uniquely qualified to provide these services in a way that is appropriate to the learning environment. HCPS school mental health providers, school-based mental health providers, that is our school counselors, school psychologists, and school social workers, have at least a master's degree in either counseling, school psychology, or social work, which exceeds the educational requirement of qualified mental health professionals.
are licensed by the Virginia Department of Education to provide services to students pre-K through grade 12 and are clinically trained to provide counseling and other services to students within a school setting. All HCPS school-based mental health providers are uniquely qualified to provide mental and behavioral health prevention services, early identification and intervention, as well as crisis referral and follow-up services to students and their families. And while slides and photos are wonderful, we thought it would be helpful to introduce you to one of our school-based mental health teams in person. With us today, we have the school-based mental health team from Ward Elementary. This team includes school counselor Lauren Rice, school psychologist Kendra Vendetti, and school social worker Jillian Aiken. And as a result of the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, ESSER, we were able to hire 10 additional school counselors this year, which were placed in schools based upon data indicating need. Denise McCullough, here today was hired and assigned to Ward Elementary to serve as a tiered intervention school counselor to provide more targeted and individualized counseling support as a part of the Ward Elementary school-based mental health team. We appreciate this team being here today to represent the school-based mental health providers in person as we share more about their important work. Thank you guys. Just this year, our school-based mental health providers began working collaboratively with the Department of Teaching and Learning to implement the evidence-based program, prevention program, Signs of Suicide, or SOS, in all of our middle and high schools. This curriculum raises additional awareness about mental and behavioral health and encourages and normalizes help-seeking behavior to act, acknowledge, care, and tell when students are worried about classmates or themselves. Program implementation continues through May, and we look forward to reviewing implementation data that will assist us in scaling this program in the upcoming year. In addition, we are working with the Department of Family and Community Engagement to offer sessions through the Bridge Builder series around mental and behavioral health during the 2021-22 school year. Additionally, school-based mental health professionals provide support in the aftermath of a crisis that facilitate a return to normalcy, are sustainable, and can help to identify and work with students in need of more intense or ongoing intervention. In fact, this year, members of the Student Support and Wellness Team participated in three days of training in the PREPARE model of crisis response and is in the process of creating the HCPS School Mental Health Crisis Response Guide, which picks up where the current crisis preparedness manual ends. This will provide a consistent guided framework to identify and meet the mental health needs of HCPS students and staff in the aftermath of an acute traumatic stressor or crisis in any HCPS school. Building the capacity of our school-based mental health providers in these areas through targeted professional learning and training opportunities has been a top priority of the Student Support and Wellness Department since its creation a year ago. In addition to examining how we can decrease staff ratios and the utilization of these staff members for activities, duties, and responsibilities unrelated to this work. For any students who require more complex interventions or intensive mental health services than are appropriate within the learning environment, our school and community-based mental health partnerships are critical and allow us to work together to address the full continuum of student needs. Once a student is identified as needing more intensive services, our school-based mental health providers, such as the ward team that is here today, can quickly connect students and families with targeted local and regional community agencies to mobilize the mental health supports necessary. Then, after receiving informed consent from the family, both providers maintain communication and continue to consult and work together to wrap supports around the student, both inside and outside of school. For example, each school has a designated Henrico area mental health liaison, and school-based mental health team members and liaisons consult often when appropriate. 
This contributes to a more seamless referral and intake process when necessary, as well as a comprehensive delivery of services for students and families. In addition to the Henrico Area Mental Health, our central office and school-based teams frequently work with a number of local and regional community-based mental health providers and pediatricians, which allows us to provide students and families with additional, more intensive layers of trauma and crisis response when necessary. Likewise, the Department of Student Support and Wellness collaborates with the HCPS Emergency Manager, Henrico's Services to Aid Recovery, the STAR team, and Henrico's Crisis Intervention Team, CIT, to ensure that we stay informed of any acute traumas or crises in the community that may have impacted an HCPS student outside of school. This allows us to proactively and immediately connect the student's school-based mental health provider with the student and family to offer supports and resources as necessary. Teaming with community-based providers and agencies ensures that services provided in school are appropriate to the learning context and those that are provided outside of school are appropriately linked to and supported in the school setting with the goal of reducing the stress on families while supporting and honoring their role as primary caregivers and decision makers regarding their child's development. In addition to the work we highlighted today, the student support and wellness staff also support a number of other division priority initiatives and programs as seen on this slide. As we look toward the upcoming year, the Student Support and Wellness Department has taken inventory of all current supports available to students and staff and has identified some additional priorities to assist in ensuring that we are prepared to address the continually emerging consequences of the global pandemic. Now more than ever, it is critical that we are able to immediately assess all students' social and emotional needs. Students who may have never shown any risk indicators may now be struggling, and students previously identified as at risk are likely to need even more help. Furthermore, our teachers and staff are the foundation of HCPS schools. We want to ensure that our teachers and staff feel supported, empowered, and trusted by school leadership so that they're able to create the conditions that lead to students' academic, social, and emotional development. To assist us in doing this, we are excited to share that we will be providing research-backed Panorama social emotional learning surveys to HCPS students and a separate survey to teachers and staff beginning in the fall of school year 21-22. The Panorama SEL survey for students is aligned with Castle Core competencies and includes targeted questions and prompts that will allow us to gather feedback and data related to student well-being and social emotional learning. This actionable data will help us to proactively identify division-wide strengths and opportunities for growth, identify specific school-wide SEL areas to prioritize as part of the Virginia Continuous School Improvement Plan, as well as identify students who may need additional, more targeted SEL supports, such as small group counseling or individual counseling. Additionally, the Panorama Teacher and Staff Survey gathers teacher and staff perceptions of their professional well-being, capacity and efficacy around supporting academic, social, and emotional learning, professional learning opportunities, cultural competency and awareness, school climate and culture, and relationships with colleagues, families, and school leadership. This data will help division leaders and administrators prioritize supports to teachers and staff, deliver targeted professional development, and create a more positive working environment. Both surveys will be conducted at multiple points during the year to assist us in tracking our progress in meeting the SEL needs and continue informing our approach and SEL supports for students, teachers, and staff at the division and school level. To further advance this work, district leadership has prioritized staff wellness and self-care as an area of focus for professional learning by once again including wellness and self-care on the 21-22 leadership roadmap. 
Through this vehicle, the Department of Student Support and Wellness will expand upon the professional learning of the previous two years in the same area by providing targeted opportunities for administrators to model and practice wellness and self-care activities that can then be immediately implemented with their own staff. Additionally, the Student Support and Wellness Department launched a Wellness, Self-Care, and Community Resource Schoology page for all HCPS staff to confidentially access additional resources, which will be updated regularly. Among these resources is the Panorama Adult SEL Toolkit, containing adult SEL measures, strategies, and activities, along with additional materials focused specifically on anxiety, stress, self-care, mindfulness, and coping skills for teachers and staff. We continue collaborative discussions with the Department of Professional Learning and Human Resources to identify and offer additional opportunities to support adult wellness and self-care and HCPS. And speaking of staff, we know that students' access to adequate staffing is essential to the quality and effectiveness of student support services. We are excited to expand our staffing in the 21-22 school year to include the continuance of 10 school counseling positions originally funded through the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund and the addition of 30 school counseling positions as a result of supplemental SR funding. This will allow us to bring our school counseling staffing ratios down to a division-wide average of one school counselor to every 325 students and significantly increase the delivery of preventative universal counseling curriculum, as well as increase student access to advanced tiered supports and interventions. We will continue to advocate for additional student support and wellness staffing, including school psychologists and school social workers during upcoming budget cycles. Furthermore, the Department of Student Support and Wellness has identified and secured a number of additional evidence-based intervention programs to expand our toolbox in preparation for the upcoming year. For example, Coping Cat and the Cat Project are cognitive behavioral therapeutic programs that target various types of anxiety in children, adolescents, and teens. These programs will be made available to schools as needed and are appropriate for delivery by a school-based mental health provider. Similarly, Check and Connect is an intensive program targeting student engagement at the secondary level. Identified students are paired with a staff member who provide personalized, timely interventions as needed in the areas of attendance, behavior, and academic achievement. This program will be made available to a number of HCPS secondary schools and will be coordinated by existing student support and wellness staff. Finally, the Student Support and Wellness Department has prioritized the need to increase stakeholder awareness and access to the expansive repository of knowledge, skills, and resources our team members and our community partners can provide. We are providing and creating a dedicated centralized webpage that can be easily accessed from the HCPS website so that students, families, and staff across the division can locate important contacts and resources consistently, quickly, and efficiently. Additionally, our central office st student support and wellness staff will continue participating in monthly partnering together meetings facilitated by the Department of Equity, Diversity, and Opportunity, English language learner information sessions in collaboration with the Department of Family and Community Engagement, town halls in collaboration with our school board members, and any other opportunity that will assist us in increasing our community outreach. Furthermore, our school-based student support and wellness staff are on the front lines, building relationships and establishing trust with students and their families. These relationships are critical to ensuring that student support and wellness resources reach the families that need them the most. Our staff regularly communicate with their students and families through a variety of platforms and help facilitate connections with community resources and agencies as needed. As a means to offer anytime, anywhere access to community agency contacts and to reduce the number of places families need to look for information, each school-based school -based mental health team will also be provided with a web page template built out with consistent local and regional information, as well as activities and resources that can be further personalized for their own school communities. We know that families are seeking information and ideas to help prepare their students for the return to school in the fall. 
So we want to ensure that resources are readily available from the school community with whom they are most connected. As you can see, the work of the Student Support and Wellness Department is expansive and essential, reaching all students in Henrico County. The Student Support and Wellness staff are trained, poised, and ready to meet the present and future needs of the HCPS school community. We look forward to continuing this work and we would like to thank you for your continued support. This concludes the overview of the Department of Student Support and Wellness, and at this time we are happy to receive any questions that you may have. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Parker and Ms. Vitek, for um, your presentation. Um, you two can take a breath now. <laughs> I'm very, very, very exhaustive and very um, detail-oriented. And again, we want to thank our school-based staff um, for your presence here, putting faces to positions and, and for the wonderful work you do in assisting us, ensuring that our students and our staff are taken care of. So thank you both, you all as well. I'll start to my left this time with Mrs. Atkins, if you would. I echo our chair with the work that you do. Go Colts over at Ward. Thank you for being here. Uh, it is certainly appreciated. Also, thank you, Ms. Vitek and Ms. Parker for all that uh, you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will continue to lead to do. Oftentimes, obstacles are wrapped, uh, opportunities are wrapped within obstacles, I should say. And I'm, I'm so pleased that the opportunity to create this team was seen and implemented because that within itself probably deserves a hand clap. Uh, you know, as you were doing your presentation, you know, I like to think about quotes and I think Frederick Douglass quote fits this moment where we know it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. That's what you're doing. That's what the counselors, the psychologists, and everyone involved is doing, uh, trying to build uh, strong children. And I do believe that, that what you're doing is going to really help, truly help, uh, you know, deepen the focus on helping children with prolonged adversity and toxic stress, because there's a lot of toxic stress in this moment. Um, you mentioned the CAT project. Can you share with me what pieces we'll be providing to our schools? I don't know if we're doing the animated pieces, the manuals. There's so many pieces to that that I don't know what pieces of funding was used and, and what parts. So can you share more about that? Absolutely. So there's two versions. Versions. There's Coping Cat and the Cat Project. And so one is for elementary and then the other is for secondary students. And so um, current funding allows us to provide and house those resources, which includes the training, the manuals, as well as the workbooks and activities for each student that participates in those small groups. And so we're able to deploy that as needed. Um, any additional funding would then allow us to provide those to all of our schools so that each of our schools could simultaneously be running those groups. Do we know if, uh, if we will have an opportunity to invest in Copalot, the camp? I don't know if you're familiar with that. Is that on the radar at all? Did you want to speak? Yeah. We haven't moved forward with any funding to um, invest in that at this moment, but we are aware and would love to explore additional funding opportunities to consider okay, that addition. I, I will put that on, on the list. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the, the other question um, that I had, let me just get to my, my notes. How are the schools selected for the check and connect opportunity? Hmm. Yeah, do you want to tell yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sure. So at this point, at this point, we are recommending that Check and Connect be implemented in our secondary schools that currently have an assigned Dean of Students. So based on the allocation of Deans of Students, based on discipline data um, and other data indicators, we are therefore going to infuse those schools with Check and Connect by training the Deans of Students and some additional behavior support facilitators on staff as well to be the implementers of that evidence-based intervention. Thank you, Ms. Vitek, for sharing that. I also had a question oftentimes, of course, we want to make sure we look at disciplinary records and um, other attributes that may need or, or will help us determine who gets chosen for what services. 
but I, I'm hopeful that we are also looking at all students need this level of service, not just those in, in trauma. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we are looking at all students and, and serving them in this deeper level of, of need, particularly in these times. Uh, let's see. And then I just, I had a recommendation. You know, we know the number one focus of the brain is the body. One area that you may want to think about exploring is movement because movement actually does stimulate the brain and it's a, a direct link for mental and physical wellness. Uh, perhaps exploring how we can shift into incorporating more physical movement into our core curriculum pieces. I know I did some class observations about two weeks ago and I saw just a great difference between the students that were sitting and learning and then the students that were allowed to do movement while they were learning. And so it may be worth exploring how we can really move or you know move the needle with wellness overall if we shift into using movement as a tool to help with wellness. So those are just a few thoughts that I, I wanted to share with you as well. So again, thank you for all of your work. Thank you for being here as well. Chairman Cooper, that concludes my thoughts. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins. Uh, Ms. Auburn. Thank you. Um, right near the end, you said your work is expansive and essential. Mm -hmm. Just truer words have never been said. <laughs> I, I, I have heard from so many parents, obviously during the pandemic, that that they just need that support more and you also said now more than ever and and i those this really resonates with me because it's so true um sad to say that it is the way it is but we um i i think we will be talking about this for a long time how the pandemic especially has affected our kids and the long time, long term effects we are obviously we can't predict, but I just think it's so great that y'all are there with so many different options. Um, I'm especially pleased to to about the survey, and from what I heard you say, that's going to be every student and staff member as well. That's right in the fall. Correct. The panorama survey. Yes, that is uh, our plan, but we will provide an opt out for parents. Sure. Correct. Right. But I, I just think that is essential information because so often, you know, we rely on parents to let us know mm -hmm. when kids are in trouble, they need help, whatever. And it's things like that that give you that little glimpse into that child that you may not have really realized was needing support. And and having data to back it up, I think is just, is so great. Um, but really um, so appreciative of the work that you do. Also sad to say a number of our schools, especially here recently have um, been calling on one form of support or another. And it is, um, you know, it's sad when communities have tragic things happen and so many of our schools have, and you guys are the ones who are there supporting families and, and it's just truly, truly work from the heart and we all appreciate it, but thank you so much. I'll turn it over to yeah. Reverend Cooper. Thank you so much, Ms. Agbar Mache. Thank you, it is great to see you both. Um, I'll just give you both some public kudos. Um, Y'all have been working so hard um, in my community and all I've heard is just um, such appreciative um, feedback of both of you and the hard work you've been doing um, supporting um, students uh, in my community. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, well, the first is actually um, a request of uh, Dr. Cashwell. Um, they gave us a chart um, of the, their school staff, of the student support and wellness school staff of aggregate across the county. Would it be possible to share with the board a breakdown of where those are located in each school? We'd be happy to provide that. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Thank you. Um, and then for you all, those, um, you talked a little bit about the second step lessons during advisory, et cetera. Um, do you have a gauge on um, their effectiveness with students and how engaged our students have been during the lessons, whether it's something they just click through or something that really is impactful? Yeah. 
thank you for asking that. I'll be happy to address <laughs> it. Um, this the SEL implementation has been a real passion of mine this year. This year, and it truly has posed some challenges for our secondary students, especially as it relates to the cameras being off. It's incredibly hard to build community and gauge um, engagement in these lessons without seeing a student's face. However, our fantastic staff have not been deterred by this at all. Mm -hmm. They've continued to move on with implementation, being creative, offering different opportunities and ways to engage those students. So at the middle school level, um, I am able to get for you a total number of lessons completed across the division, which is in the thousands. Um, our teachers have been committed to providing these lessons for the students who are showing up. And that's been a really big piece. Um, the lessons, the second step lessons provide direct instruction. They're not all asynchronous, so it's not something they're expected to do entirely on their own. It's kind of a blended format. Um, so the feedback we've received from teachers has been that the students that come are engaged. I've heard student voice, it's been emailed to me from teachers, building leaders, that these kids love this, they enjoy this opportunity to connect with one another. So while we don't have any hard and fast data on outcomes, um, we're really excited about the panorama yes. survey to start having that type of outcome. We do have a lot of anecdotal information from the teachers leading um, the activities and from students themselves. No, that's wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing that. As someone who um, personally had my own journey through adolescent mental health, um, you know, I kind of use that lens when I look through things as to, you know, what, what really could have been a support or what would have helped put me on somebody's radar earlier in my journey, if, if you know, if you will. And so I'm um, thrilled to hear that there is genuine engagement in these lessons, um, which, you know, hopefully correlates to them really making a difference for our students. So thank you. Um, when we, um, I was um, thrilled to see the trauma informed piece of this presentation. Um, and I was just curious, you know, so we have, um, you shared that employees have gone through training, our new, our new employees will go through training, but do we have someone who is um, more of an expert, um, even if it's not a certif you know, certified expert um, in each of our buildings or how close are we to that? Great, great question. So what we provided to staff at the beginning of the year is what we like to call that tier one mm -hmm. level of training, just kind of basic information. Then each school has a school-based mental health team of providers, and those are the experts that each school team has. Like I uh, said, some of them do hold an actual certificate um, certifying them, but all of them have received extensive training on their own and through Henrico County Public Schools Professional Learning around trauma. So there are certainly many people in the building from the school-based mental health team and other student support and wellness team members that are able to provide that additional more in-depth trauma support at the school level. Yeah, I think that's so important because I know as a teacher, you know, you get lots of trainings and you try to become an expert in and all, but it's often, you know, when you're immersed in a situation that you really want some extra support, there's nothing better than somebody in your building you can go to with questions and support. And um, there is a fallacy that uh, trauma only exists in certain parts of the county. And I know for my district, particularly talking with parents, that that um, in some ways very negatively impacts my district because there's part of my district where people assume, well, there, there must be no trauma at that school. And then often the students who are experiencing trauma fall through the gaps, mm -hmm. if you will, because there aren't as intensive supports um, on the surface. You know, they, they can be found in the school, but they're not quite as pervasive. And so mm -hmm. as we can work more towards um, you know, moving more of also our instructional personnel past tier one to tier two or tier three so that they really are, you know, the, the expert on the hall, you know, on, on how to, you know, support their um, colleagues. Um, and then my last part um, is just, well, first of all, I'm glad you brought up the additional counselors because like that ESSER funding is like a game changer between that and the um, reading specialist. It's just, um, 
the original bum budget. I'm not going to say it was a bummer, but it was just like, <laughs> oh, I wish we'd gotten those positions back. And then once the ESSER funding came through, it's like, okay, we're really on our way. So I'm glad yes. you um, brought that up. Um, and then the last is just, you know, j just a comment or observation. You know, I think. Um, that student support and wellness, um, not only do we have y'all's incredible team doing, you know, really a lot of the hefty lift, heavy lifting, but it also has to be a lens on how we look through all the nuts and bolts of how our school day works and how our programming works as we look through high school redesign, you know, all these pieces and look at how those pieces either positively or negatively impact um, student uh, student wellness. And so, you know, as we continue on this journey, as we look at filling gaps um, next year, I think it's also an opportunity to look systemically with the lens um, of, of student wellness on um, how a lot of our approaches um, could um, either are positively affecting or could be tweaked to, to more positively affect um, students. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shea. Uh, Ms. Kinsella. Yes, I, I think I'll begin by mentioning what I did at the last at the last meeting, which is um, I just feel in the fall we just need to be so prepared. And I love this presentation because I think everyone is going to be bringing in so much in their backpack: mm -hmm. students, teachers, staff, you know, families. I mean, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, do we have an estimate now, do you believe, um, where we truly understand the, the social emotional needs and the mental health needs? Do, do you think we have a pretty good handle on it currently before the screener in the fall? So I think that, um so I think that the Panorama Social Emotional Learning Survey is going to be incredibly helpful for us to really make sure that we are giving every student a voice, um, not just the students who are able to show up and turn on the camera, that we are giving every student a voice so we can really find those students that might be slipping through the cracks or may not be displaying behaviors that would otherwise be noticed. So I do think that's going to be key um, for us to be more preventative and not responsive or only responsive. Um, and I know this year, just given the nature of the year, there's been a lot of response. And so I, we really are looking forward to having that to be able to assist us in being more preventative and proactive when meeting the needs of our students. So um, so with that, so with that being yeah. said, I, I, I certainly like being proactive and not reactive, yes. especially where mental health mm -hmm. uh, is concerned uh, for our students, families, and staff. But here, once we get the screener, um, if there isn't an opt out, pretty much every student will take it unless you opt out. Correct. There will be an opt out option for parents. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what does the what does the track in process look like? You know, we we identify a student, sure. and and then what happens? So I want to speak just mm -hmm. a little bit about the fact. So the Panorama SEL survey is not a universal mental health screener. So it is a social emotional learner learning survey, and so it's formative, not kind of diagnostic. And um, it really identifies student, teacher, and staff perceptions of how supported they feel at school, socially and emotionally, and their own SEL skill development. So I do want to kind of clarify the difference between that and a universal mental health screamer. So, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to identify students at risk for a mental health or behavioral health disorder per se, um, or students at risk for harm, danger to self or others that would require kind of an immediate response in order to ensure safety. So it's going to provide actionable data for us that we have time to take and look at and then determine how to respond. And so there'll really be tiered levels of response. This allows us as a division to look at the data and see where our areas of strength are and our areas of growth. Um, but it also allows the schools just to look at their own specific school climate and see what they might want to include in terms of SEL goals and their VSIP plans mm -hmm. and other school improvement plan um, goals and objectives. And then it allows our school-based mental health teams um, and other behavior support personnel the opportunity to then look student by student and see what students they can identify to pull into small counseling groups, what students might need some additional support, or what students we can proactively reach out to and connect with community resources. So really a layered response um, depending on the outcome. 
No, I and, appreciate that. And detail. we do, I'm sorry, More we do detail. plan to administer the survey three times a year as we would other universal screeners, um, but we also have the opportunity to administer it more often. So if we were working with certain groups of students and we wanted to get more additional feedback more regularly, we could. Because I, I get where it's not a clinical diagnosis, mm -hmm. but I mean, at least it's some something where we're gonna be able yes. to get a, get a feeling for every single student that of course doesn't opt out mm -hmm. and just, just know where they are. I mean, I just believe that's critical for us. Um, so as we, as you just mentioned, with the different needs in different buildings and each of our school communities being so different, um, how are our individual school teams um, trained? Do they receive the same training or is it tailored, which in my mind it should be, um, but I don't know what it looks like because our communities that we serve are so different. Absolutely, what that's is an the training excellent question. Like? Yes, so it's, it's a bit of both, to be quite, quite honest with you. Um, our school-based mental health teams and behavior support personnel receive kind of a standard level of training that we provide across the board throughout the division, but then there's also training that's targeted based on the specific needs of the school. And so um, it, it really is a little bit of both. There's kind of a standard level mm -hmm. of training that we would be the expectation for all of our providers um, to learn and understand and be knowledgeable about, but then we are able to really be specific and individualized training for specific groups based on their school's needs. Good, thank you. And as we see, um, I guess I just see our needs being so great in the fall. Do we anticipate, um, I know we've, uh, some of our social workers and, and school counselors and our school psychologists and, and family advocates have done so many different duties um, in the past year during the pandemic. Do we anticipate um, more, uh, what was it, the school counselors reached out in communities in person doing at-home check, check-ins. Do we anticipate more creative outreach like that, um, maybe before school, after school, or virtual outreach? Are we anticipating anything like that? I think a lot of those are school-based decisions. Our school communities are so connected within their own community. And so you'll see a variety of different things happening um, just depending on the school and on the location and the needs of their community. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's just varying levels of that outreach, um, but outreach in general is incredibly important. And our school-based teams are really the teams that are there and connected with their families, and then we can provide them with the resources they need to do that. And they, can you explain to me a little bit more about the cognitive, um, the cognitive resource you showed? I think it was for secondary students. Um, um, sure. I don't think I've seen. Have have we really done cognitive um, before outside of the school psychologist in terms of testing? So we're not testing or doing any type of assessment. And right. so our school, all of our school-based mental health providers, um, they utilize a variety of different mod models or theoretical orientations that they pull from when providing counseling services to inform counseling interventions. And so there's a long list of um, models and approaches that a counselor could take and is trained in. And so it's really more about assessing the student's needs and matching the intervention or approach with that student. There's a lot of different variables that go into that decision, but some of the approaches that are often used in the school environment may include cognitive behavioral therapy, absolutely, solution-focused brief therapy, um, we do a lot of rational and motive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing, strengths-based counseling, reality therapy, choice theory. So there's a number of things that um, are appropriate for the learning environment that our staff are trained to provide in terms of models and approaches. And really, again, it's, it's important that our providers are identifying and applying the models um, that will best address that specific student's needs. Do we have, which, which one of our staff members, uh, is it just the um, school psychologists that actually have the cognitive training? Because the behavior, the cognitive behavioral or? training is, is so integral. Yeah. I know having um, done a lot of work and listened to Dr. Noel talk about some of the behavior. So mm -hmm. I'm, I really want to better understand um, the behavior, you know, what drives the behavior mm -hmm. um, and, and how many um, staff members do we have that are equipped 
All of our school-based mental health providers um, have a strong understanding and training of cognitive behavioral therapy as well as other therapies. So again, it's really, it's really a matter of matching the right model or approach with the student and that need. But all of our school-based mental health providers, which are your school counselors, your school psychologists, and your school social workers, okay. um, do have training in a dumb number of different models and approaches. And we yep. continue to provide training to them. Just this year, we actually did have an intensive training from the Beck Institute for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for our school-based mental health providers. Okay, and then toward the, on slide 23, you had a learning series calendar. When it um, referenced wellness, that is staff wellness, it's not training for staff. Can the, you go to slide 23? I think it's maybe the leadership roadmap. This one? There you go. Yeah, is the, what is the Clarity Learning Series? Is, is it the wellness and self-care for staff? The Clarity and Learning series is actually tied to the teaching and learning um, framework, the learning culture. But so that's training. Yes, those are trainings. And those are identified dates where the Division of Learning is supporting the Clarity Learning series. If the quarterly leadership dates are listed on the lower left. Um, and it just is show, showing that at all of those meetings and throughout the year, we are going to be grounded in these um, three kind of markers. If, if I might, I, if I might make a, a suggestion, perhaps a recommendation, knowing how busy September 16th is with back to school, perhaps could that training take place in, in August? I mean, that's a training, right? The September 16th, all staff, it's a training? I believe that is what is planned. A and then perhaps use September 16th as a check-in where our staff can, can check in and we can learn what supports, what, what we're seeing in our schools now that everybody's back. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to actually see everyone be trained prior to, prior to schools opening. Um, versus, and then we can maybe have a check-in on September 16th. Dr. Cashwell, might that make sense? It does, and we'll certainly take a look um, in, you know, one of the things I think what, and this team's probably going, oh, because they that part of the learning series doesn't necessarily belong directly to them, but is on this broader map. So I think for the purposes of um, today's presentation, what they were attempting to show is that wellness and self-care is a part of all of our pre-established quarterly leadership uh, meetings. And what we've done over the past two or three years is provide our leaders um, a roadmap that says, hey, these are the things we're going to focus on these years. We have uh, This year we have three dates to do that, August, November, and February, where we all come together, um, leadership of the school division. And so uh, knowing that there is some work to be done on the teaching and learning framework, we're looking at learning culture, but wellness and self-care is on there each and every time, particularly as it relates to staff self-care. But your point is well taken about the Clarity Learning Series, which which it sounds like relates to something um, with teaching and learning framework potentially. So we will take that feedback to that team directly and look at making sure we're um, doing the best we can I know that part of that may have to do with um, contract time when teachers are available to be uh, trained, but your point is excellent and that we want to make sure we're doing as much front loading as we can. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for um, this presentation. Very thorough, thoughtful, <laughs> and much needed. Thank, thank you, you, Reverend Cooper. All right, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kinsella. Um, just a few quick questions. Um, on, I think it was slide five, you mentioned 146 full-time counselors and three part-time counselors. Was just curious to know how many or what percentage of our counselors are bilingual. Or, you know, just curious about that. There we go. That is an excellent question. I can certainly um, find that information out and send that to you. Thank you yep. so much. And also, when we talk about the efforts, just the, the, the macro nature of everything that you all are doing, what, what are the efforts that you all are, I guess, building into to the framework of to ensure that your efforts are culturally responsible? What, what are we doing and in, the intentionality in regards to that? Yeah. 
thank you for asking that. We've been talking a lot about that and really partnering with our equity and diversity department to ensure that we look at all of our practices through that lens of cultural responsiveness mm -hmm. and helping to identify gaps and areas of improvement. We've also committed to um, numerous trainings for our own staff so that we can start to shift and address and, and uh, kind of adopt that lens for each and every staff member in the student support and wellness department so that we can layer it into the work. I appreciate that. That's important. I, I'm mm -hmm. glad that there's an intentional effort and, yes. and the consciousness of the necessity of it. Mm -hmm. um, next question, with the SEL lessons, mm -hmm. um, I guess, can you address the students that don't attend? Um, do we know the reasons why they don't attend? And do we have a kind of a breakdown by school to help us be more focused on that? So attendance for the lessons because they are part of the school day. And so attendance for the lessons would be tied into attendance for the class or for okay. the normal school. So those would kind of go hand in hand. Um, and so a lot of the reasons it would be similar okay. as to why a student might not be logging on to attend class that day, because we are working to embed SEL throughout instruction and not have it be a separate initiative. Sure. And so um, that is tied into this, the, the normal school day for each student. Thank you. Um, around tra trauma-informed care, um, what's the evaluative data that we're going to prov provide to assess the fidelity of it? And, and can you speak to the cases that we're serving right now? At a division level, we have adopted the TRESIA, the Trauma Responsive Schools Implementation Assessment, which is recommended via the SHAPE system. It's a national survey instrument. It's self-report by school teams. And so this was the first year that we did it. Um, we, we kind of echo your question, your concern. We've done a lot of different training around trauma-informed practices, but it was really hard to measure mm -hmm. implementation. Sure. And are we advancing? So um, after researching, this was where we landed and now we have a fantastic baseline mm -hmm. for all of our schools and programs coming off January. Uh, as I mentioned, we've provided that data to all of our schools. We've also compiled it at a division level so we can identify areas of strength and growth, which we're aligning our professional development and resources to. Interestingly, one of our big areas was staff self-care. Right. So it's included on the leadership roadmap. We have numerous opportunities mm -hmm. throughout the summer. Um, so we will be completing this again in January, same schools, same teams, to monitor growth over time and continue to develop and target areas of need. So basically baseline was established in January. So yes, the, whole, the, the cycle is what's necessary to kind of really delve into the data and determine mm -hmm. the growth and, and the effectiveness. Is there something you want to say? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't know. I just saw these eyes beating at me. I didn't know. I said, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all good. I just want to make sure you're good. We can, we can talk. Um, um, you mentioned also that the staff will be required to complete the uh, trauma and care training as as um, as a part of the onboard onboarding process going forward. I guess one of the questions I want to know is: Is there a percentage of staff who've already completed this training? Do we know? Yes, all of our staff completed it. All of our current staff completed it in the fall. Okay, is there an effort to expand it, maybe to um, substitute teachers, even volunteers in schools? I mean, how, how do we, you know, get, go, go beyond just them because they're not the only ones that need this training? That's a, that's a great suggestion. We'll certainly take note of that mm -hmm. and see what we can do. We did um, take make active efforts to include um, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, all of our staff, not just our teachers, anyone that had contact with students, as well as all of our central office staff um, right. this year. And we continue to, we intend to continue to do that with our full-time staff. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what position they're serving, we want to be sure they have exposure to this training. Yeah, I think that'd be very um, interesting to see where we land in regards mm -hmm. to the volunteers and, and as well as the part-time, because again, right. when you talk about um, consistency, right? We want to ensure that part-time and full-time, there is this mm -hmm. level of consistency. And, and last question, um, when we speak about the panorama survey for students, um, is there a targeted response rate that we're looking for? Um, I'm just saying from uh, survey fatigue, right? I mean, how many departments okay. are having surveys? I mean, we hear about surveys, but this one is a very important survey. So I, I appreciate the effort, but is there a targeted uh, uh, response rate? 
So this is a survey that would be completed during in school, during the school day. Um, and so we can certainly look and set a goal mm -hmm. for a targeted response rate for the survey, but it's our intention for as many students mm -hmm. and staff members to complete as possible. So it's not something they'd be taking home and doing on their own. It's something we'd be walking them through. It's not a fairly lengthy mm -hmm. assessment. Sure. Um, and the wording and prompts and the questioning um, have a, it's a survey in which students feel typically like they're able to have a voice. And so they actually want to engage in the survey and they want their feedback to be known. And so we are excited about the opportunity for that. Well, thank you so much for answering that. Yeah. Well, um, that's all I have, Ms. Parker and Ms. Vitek. Thank you so much for Chairman this. Chairman Cooper. Yes. I'm sorry. I had one other question, if if I may. Yes, ma'am. Um, have, have you and your team considered having a family or a student roundtable over the summer so that you can receive and share feedback before school starts in the fall. I would also ask to explore creating or having a meeting with PTA leaders to receive share feedback and I think PTAs may have an opportunity to also help prepare families for the survey in pushing the importance of it. Uh, and so reaching out to those three groups separately. Mm -hmm. So particularly reaching out to your secondary students for some sort of round table over the summer, reaching out to your families individually sometime over the summer, and then reaching out to your PTA presidents, not only to receive and share feedback, but to help prepare for what's coming in the fall. I think they can help in this effort, particularly all PTAs could help in this effort around student support and wellness and reaching out over the summer may give you additional information and data to help as schools open up five days a week in the fall. So just something to think about and consider as you're planning. Absolutely, thank you. Great idea, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Anyone else have anything they wanna follow up with? Um, Dr. Cashwell? All right, thanks again uh, to our school-based uh, team who's visiting us and to all our school-based teams who are engaged in this work and our central staff and supports as well. We appreciate the uh, very comprehensive presentation. We'll look forward to seeing how many of the next steps are implemented and monitoring progress from there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for the next item, I am going to be seeking at the next board meeting um, your approval of our education fee and tuition schedule for the 21-22 school year. So at this point, I'm providing an opportunity for the board to review that uh, fee schedule. And you'll notice a red line document was provided and it does include uh, the tuition as it would be set for non-resident elementary students who would be approved on a variance for their part-time or full-time uh, employee, uh, permanent part-time or full-time employee parent. Are there any questions? We're happy to answer those related to the fee schedule. I did have one. Um, I was just interested in what's included in the cosmetology toolkit and what caused the increase from 150 to 220. Someone who can give you those specifics is coming forward. Yeah, <laughs> you, you'll notice there's lot, there's little variation year to year in those, but some of the materials do change over time and we always wanna make sure we're providing them uh, at the best cost possible. Well, good afternoon, um, and yes, I, it is the complete toolkit that they would need if they started their, if they go into a shop and start to work. Uh, and we, the part of the increase, we found that the scissors that were in there for cutting were not holding up over a long period of time, so that was the increase. Now, I will tell you for students that may not uh, have the ability to afford the kit. We do work with them. We also keep spare kits in the classroom. So if a student is in the classroom, they still get the opportunity to learn it and they can buy the kit later if they so desired. So there is an opportunity. I've, I've had some, some questions about, about that particular fee and now that that fee is being raised, if we have students that can't afford uh, to pay that upfront, um, there are kids in the classroom that they can borrow until they can get the money and be able to afford. Yes, ma'am. We would okay. never not allow a student the opportunity just based on not being able to afford the kit. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's important for families to hear that so that they can share with their children that it is not an obstacle to continue to pursue cosmetology if that is what your heart desires because we are prepared to help them with that cost. Yes, ma'am. So thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins. I'll, I'll come this way first. Let's start this way. Ms. Ms. Agwin, you anything? Um, just one quick comment. Um, the way this is printed, um, if you go to dual enrollment, it says fee per course. We had this conflict, as some of you might remember a while ago. If we could put fee per course in bold or something or underline it just so parents understand fully, I know they have to sign and all of that stuff too, but it, I have still gotten comments from people that don't understand that that is a, per, even though it's written right there, um, if we could do something to highlight that, that it is per course. Um, but also, I am so glad to see that um, each year there's an elimination of something. And, you know, a lot of these fees, we, it's providing the students the materials that they need. And I know we can't absorb all of these costs, but I'm just so glad to see that some things have gone away. And, and, and that, as Ms. Atkins point out, we, it is, an, there are options for kids so that these fees are not an obstacle because we want them all to have the opportunity. So I, I'm glad to hear that as well. Yeah, thank you for the feedback about the dual enrollment piece. And I know uh, certainly for those who are enrolling in the ACA programs, we're really clear about that. They do have to sign, they've acknowledged it, but we'll do our best to continue to make that messaging as clear as we can. And um, also thank you for acknowledging the, the fee reductions, the laptop fee, the science Gone. fees and PE yep. fees are no longer a part of what we ask. And those are core curricular, uh, core, you know, things that all students are participating in. And so so you'll see these fees are associated with specific right. um, add-on situations. And we're then always going to work with families if there is an obstacle so that the fee isn't one. All right. Ms. Shea, uh, Ms. Auburn, are you finished? No, I'm done. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Shea. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to acknowledge that um, the elimination of those fees is really um, a continuation of a commitment that our superintendent made to look into these and reduce them and um, to reduce really funding inequities that um, existed between different parts of our county. And so, um, so often that hard work doesn't always go acknowledged once it's done. And so um, I know there's a continual review of these, but I just wanted to bring to the public's attention, you know, the science, like you said, the science fee, the laptop fee, all these general education um, kind of non-elective fees um, are no more. And it's providing, um, more equitable funding across our county when we look at science labs and that sort of thing. So um, I appreciate your work there, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you, Ms. Shea, Ms. Um, Kinsella. Yes, I only had um, one actually question or request for a point of clarity for any employees, again, back to the uh, out of county tuition as to why it's gonna be payable in um, two installment payments, but cannot be deducted out of your paycheck. I know we discussed this in the committee uh, meeting, but uh, it's not what I do, so I don't want to go on the record with the answer as to why it can't be a payroll deduction. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Weck, uh, Chief Financial Officer, and um, really the uh, the Alna County tuition is a calculation that finance has done every year. I believe you asked earlier how we come up with that number, and that's really looking, and this is consistent with the, the fiscal year 22, uh, 2022 budget that you adopted earlier on, on, on this afternoon's agenda. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the fee of 5,110 uh, actually happened to be uh, applicable both to elementary and, and, and secondary education. Uh, we really don't have, a, I guess, a history of how many um, employees might, might take advantage of that. It has not been a material issue until, until this time, so that maybe that's something we, we could consider moving forward. But we did want to, um, when taken into the context of child care costs for our uh, permanent full-time and part-time employees wanted to go on the record that they, that, that payment could may, may be made into installments. I don't know that we've ha had allowed that in, in, in prior years. But it, uh, right. But I, I just thought I would address it because typically when, when there's something that we're offering to employees, the, the next question is, can it be a payroll deduction? Yeah, and I, I'm not prepared to answer the questions related to the payroll deduction logistics, but I know that there are only specific scenarios in which that process could be uh, deployed related to the way we cut paychecks, if you will. But that's certainly something we can look into if okay. there's enough demand, and I think that would probably drive uh, the scenario. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Uh, Dr. Castro, a quick question. Um, the computer systems technology software fee, it increased three times the previous amount. It went from, I think, 25 to 85. Mac, you, can you tell me real quick um, what what is included in that fee? Thank you, sir. You should have stayed up here. I don't know why you went back. <laughs> you, you should you must, sit up You must front. be getting some steps in or up something. I need the steps time. in. Yeah. I got you. Um, yes, if you notice, like three lines up, we removed one fee, moved it down. What happened, the software itself now includes the textbook and some additional training materials, mm -hmm. and that's the reason for the increase. All right, and, and then we, you know, we've all kind of shared about the equity piece and, and, and just making sure that the equity and access and opportunity go together. Uh, is, it, is it specifically and explicitly stated you know, what families need to do, or what the process is, if fees are cumbersome, and you know, they, they need, they wanna apply for a waiver, you know, process for approval, or you know, if they can't pay the fee, what, what's that process, where is it well, stated? Well, currently the way it stands right now, because our teachers, you know, they want the students in the classroom, so if a kid uh, is unable to play, pay the fee, they you immediately reach out to the parents and say, what, we can, what can we do to help make this work? Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is turn a student away because of a fee issue. So there's no, there's no process, official process? No, sir. Yeah, I think at the school-based level there are. So the fee collection process is sort of driven at the school uh, level and they monitor who's paid and who hasn't and, and they work with families. And uh, you know, on most of the material I've seen printed individually from schools, it does note that if there's a financial hardship, they, they should contact the school. And rather than coming up with one way that might work, whether it's chunking the payment or waiving the, uh, the fee or leveraging some sort of grant or other, for example, the Henrico Education Foundation will often come through. Um, you know, they don't necessarily indicate what the solution will be until they've worked with the family. But I think to your point, we can do a better job making it clear. So anyone who might read our fee schedule or see some of these documents might not, uh, if they know that there's a hardship, um, may not realize they do have a course of action that they can take. Should they not have heard that at the school level, we can reiterate that at the central level. I think and that's almost, important. I guess the, for me personally, it's, it's, it's oftentimes, you know, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So right, if I don't really know that there is a process that I have the opportunity to at least say I'm having a hardship, you know, then I may not ask it, I'll just yeah. ignore it or I just won't do it. And I just wanna make sure that it is clear, it's concise and that persons are, it's it's equitable. If, if it, so I mean, thank you for that commitment. Yes, we, we will work on that. Thank you, Mac. I'm not gonna make you walk up here anymore, I promise you. Anyone else have any questions on that? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Castro. Uh, well, I guess we, we need to um, review that more, there you go. All right, two more items from me. Uh, next, I'm seeking the school board's um, awarding of a construction contract for the replacement of the dry pipe sprinkler systems to Atlantic Constructors Incorporated in the amount of $296,907 for Ash Elementary School. I so wish I could make this uh, motion, but I can't. Uh, is there a motion to award the contract? I got gotcha. you. Thank you. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The contract has been awarded. Thank you. For the last item, I'm recommending that the school board approve a right-of-way agreement between the County School Board of Henrico County, Virginia and Virginia Electric and Power Company or Dominion Energy, Virginia for the Tucker High School Replacement Project. Well, well I guess Ms. Shea and Ms. Ogburn will take care of that one. Uh, so moved. You want I, let me ask yeah. first. Oh, yeah. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> is, is go right there, ahead. Is there a motion to approve the right-of-way agreement for Tucker High School replacement. So moved. Ms. Ogwin, um, is there a second? Second. And Mrs. Kinsella, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The agreement has been approved. All right, thank you for your enthusiastic approval of those last two items. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that concludes items from the superintendent. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent and staff for your presentations and the dialogue. Uh, next item on the agenda is our public forum. And we want to ensure persons that citizens had until eight o'clock this morning to submit comments for the board's review. Uh, using a link on HCPS website. Citizens took advantage of that opportunity and we sincerely appreciate your input. Um, comments were compiled and provided to each of us prior to the start of today's meeting. And I want you to know those comments have also been posted in board docs as well. Um, um, is there any unfinished business? Anyone? 
Any new business? Anyone? The next item on our agenda is the announcement of our meeting dates. Um, um, Ms. Atkins, do you have any announcements? I do have a few announcements, Chairman Cooper. Yes, Thank you. And I have a presentation just to assist me in sharing information. So, Collins Spring, Sandston, and Verina, I provided an update on five of the seven boards and committees I serve on in February. And I promised you that I would share more on the remaining, and I'm going to do that in this moment. Uh, and so the first that I'll share is the Instruction Materials Review Committee. The responsibility of this committee is to review materials referred to the committee by Dr. Cashwell or her staff. The committee has not received any materials to review and therefore has not met this year so far. The second is the Special Education Advisory Committee. This committee is also known as SEAC, and the duties include, but definitely not limited to, there are several more, but I'll just highlight a few, and they include opportunities for the community uh, to address general or systemic issues. Uh, the committee also offers recommendations regarding the education of students with disabilities as well as share information with parents on special education. The committee has not met so far this year due to COVID, and so I am looking forward to this committee um, moving forward with meetings as we get closer uh, to the fall. Also, if you would like to serve on the committee, feel free to send an email to SEAC, S as in Sam, E as in egg, A as in apple, C as in cat, SEAC at henrico.k12.va.us. Also, it is a pleasure, I wanna share with you that uh, I have volunteered to join the Henrico Education Foundation Nominating Committee and the purpose of this committee is to nominate influential individuals to serve on the Henrico Education Foundation Board and currently in the process of sharing some names and contact information um, that uh, from individuals from the Verina District and I'll be sharing that with this particular committee. I'll move forward to the next slide. Resources is something that we talk a lot about in the Verina District. I wanna thank all of the organizations on this slide uh, that have invested in Highland Springs, Sanson, and Verina, certainly stepped up, used your voices, time and certainly your money as well to empower and offer resources to me, each other, students, families, and entire communities. I'm only going to highlight a few of the bullets on this slide. I'll start with the Cornerstone Farm at Fairfield. I just want to acknowledge the level of volunteerism, investment, uh, effort from key stakeholders, students especially that come out and, and help at the farm, HCPS staff and volunteers, you are certainly worth highlighting. I am so thankful for the work that is done there. These are positive and resilient humans and they keep this farm operational. They are just amazing. And this is yet another resource that offers exposure, education, and food to the community, to students and families. And wanted to just uh, share that and if you want to learn more about it you can go to Fairfield and, and take a look uh, of course make sure you call and make sure that uh, it's appropriate for you to go or you could go to collaborative.squarespace.com that's a website that shares more about what's happening there Highland Springs, Sanson, and Verina, when I said we're moving to a better normal, we are. I am super excited. On February 4th, uh, Ms. Jones reached out to me and she told me she was a part of the community outreach group at Capital One. And she wanted to share a resource with me called FinVest. And she felt like it would be a, a wonderful opportunity for students in the Verina district. So of course I engaged in that discussion and to give you a little bit more information about FinVest, the mission of this program is to empower individuals with the knowledge, skills, and tools to confidently achieve financial stability. And the overall goal is to build a path to financial freedom. And listen, wisdom gained as a child on how to handle money will serve them well when they become an adult. 
And so I'm pleased to share that this program will be offered in our district next school year. I am aware that it'll also be offered in other districts. So shout out to Ms. Jones for contacting me and caring so much about the Verona district and the families and students that live within it to make the connection on this yet another wonderful resource. The other bullet that I'm going to highlight is the Volunteer Income Tax Program. Ms. Downey contacted me, and this was in October of 2020, and shared with me how this program could benefit Henrico County Public School students in the Verina District, and also help community members as well. The IRS would provide free training for students, and the students would become certified volunteer income tax preparers. And with the help of the phenomenal Mac Baton, who spoke here on today, this, imp uh, this program was implemented. The first site opened in February. I believe the second site opened in March. It is still tax season, so our students and the IRS are certainly busy. But what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for our students to get exposure and experience while simultaneously preparing taxes in the community. And so yet another win, another move for a better normal in Verina, Sandston, and Highland Springs. And then I'll move on to talk about another topic, and, it, and that topic is our athletic programs. I know this year has been challenging for our athletic programs across all of Henrico. Hats off to the athletic directors, coaches, parents, and athletes. If you're wondering why I'm talking about this, it's because it's a segue to a bullet on this slide, which is the field hockey program. The Highland Springs High School girls field hockey team was the only field hockey team in the East End this year. Coach Rumbach, Coach Redford, the team mom, and these scholarly ladies were determined, regardless of their record, regardless of the pandemic, and still academically did well. They were determined to keep this program moving forward. And therefore, I am overjoyed to share that HCPS staff and volunteers are working on providing additional support to the girls' field hockey program in the Verina District. And more information is coming to Highland Springs High School, Verina High School, Fairfield Middle School, Elko Middle School, and Roth Middle School families very soon. The uh, Highland Springs girls field hockey team had 10 members. Seven of those members are moving on and going to college, which leaves them with three members. And so it was critically important to the girls and everyone that was invested that more support was given and is a joy to know that Everyone came together, Dr. Cashwell, the staff, everyone is coming together to make sure that we keep this field hockey program alive in the East End. So I will close on that topic by saying that Verina District, the girls field hockey team is a start. I have sharp focus on our other girls athletic programs, girls volleyball, girls basketball, and many other girls athletic programs. I am looking at those too, and I do hear you. I, I'm receiving the emails about girl power. I'm excited about girl power too. I believe it, all right? So I will move on to the next slide on special recognition. In this moment, I want to express appreciation for the honesty, the work, and the commitment of the teachers and staff at the Achievable Dream Academy at Highland Springs High School. This school has been in the paper often. The topic of key stakeholder discussions over months and certainly at top of mind for me indeed. The students are thriving now. The staff continues to do what they do best, and that's love their students, provide instruction, coupled with exploring best practices. I recently uh, attended a staff meeting there, and we had candid conversations about feelings, recommendations, and several bold changes that are taking place in that school. 
Also, I had the opportunity to participate in some class observations at the school and better understand the opportunities and challenges in the classroom. Shout out to those teachers uh, whom uh, welcomed me in their classrooms and got to sit there for several hours and, and just observe. And the level of energy um, that the teachers were providing in their classroom along with just nonstop multitasking was impressive. There are positive results happening in this school. And I wanna also specifically thank some other individuals for their collaborative leadership efforts. They are Ms. Farmer, she is the Director of Operations and Student Services, Dr. Tolliver, the Principal, Mr. Thorpe, Director of Elementary Education, Dr. Grant, Chief of School Leadership, Dr. Vreeland, the ADA President and CEO, as well as her staff, and Superintendent Dr. Cashwell. A very, very special thank you to each of you. And finally, a moment about heroes. There are so many heroes in our school system. However, I wanna focus on a few of our quiet heroes. They are the librarians and custodians that serve well at Achievable Dream Academy at Highland Springs, Baker, Donahoe, Fair Oaks, Montrose, Sandston, Seven Pines, Verina Elementary, Ward, Elko, Rolf, Highland Springs High School, and Verina High School. And I am going to express my thoughts about our librarians and custodians uh, with a poem that I wrote. And after I read this poem, you can feel free to uh, share your thoughts with me about it. I would look forward to hearing from them, Highland Springs, Sandston, and Verina. So I'll start with the first, which is librarian. Some say it's your J-O-B, but I see you so differently. To me, you are the key, the one who shows me where to discover drama, romance, and history. It feels good when I'm in your quiet place called the library, a librarian, the one who understands the importance of books and literacy and loves children beyond what their eyes could ever possibly see. My kudos to librarians. The next poem is dedicated to custodians. Comes in early and sometimes stay late, rarely complains and patiently waits. Not into arguing or debates. Your work ethic is admirable and many can't relate to what it means to be you, to be great. You, you work back-to-back -back shifts if that's needed by the school. I notice your work, I think you're cool, and I'm grateful for you. You keep our buildings clean and looking so nice. The kids know your name, and you constantly have to pick up after them and put things in their place, in the classroom, the bathroom, cafeteria, office or the hallway. I salute you for who you are and what you do every day, always. That's my custodi uh, kudos to custodians. Pastor Cooper, that concludes my announcements for the Verena District. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Um, Atkins. Again, I want to now announce uh, our next meeting date. The school board's next meeting will be a work session scheduled on Thursday, May the 27th, 2021 at 1 p.m. in the New Bridge Learning Center Auditorium. The meeting time may be adjusted if needed. That being said, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.